do in the future um, to really help understand this is the future. This is the future of political media. This is the future of media in general is starting to actually democratize the process, pull it away from all the in the the levers of power in all the leftist institutions now into the hands of, of particularly people who care and about um, interest-based, value-based things. And that's the direction of media is interest-based, value-based media. And so we're going to jump in and listen to a little bit of this town hall with Timcast IRL. I will comment throughout um, and uh, this will be part of what we do. So thanks for joining me. It's it's not shocking that almost every single news story that we hear about January 6th involves those who are acting violently. Mm -hmm. But I think perhaps one thing that we can do better, especially, uh, you know, we've got uh, scanner.com, scnr.com, we, we have a, a news team, is focus on those who are peaceful, nonviolent, and shut up after the fact. I met a, a, a woman at a restaurant, and this is in the Maryland area. She went down to D.C. with her husband. They said, this is a story she told me. She showed up an hour and a half or so after the rioting had already concluded and people were actually leaving. She walks up to the Capitol building with open sidewalks. There's people standing on the grass talking. There's people walking around. The doors are wide open. Her and her husband walk up, see people and the police standing hey, there, walk on walking in. around. She said she was in for a few minutes, asked what was going on. They yep. said nothing much and said, okay, and she left. She was sentenced to 18 months in jail. Yep. They, the, the court did not care that she was nonviolent, that she was just a tourist who went to see Donald Trump speak, was unaware of any barricades. I think the issue is, especially for the corporate press, those stories aren't newsworthy for them. They're not going to get clicks. If you take a look at how CNN reported the acquittal of Matthew Martin, they still just don't want to admit that a police officer waved a man into the building and a judge agreed he was welcomed in. They still try and make it seem like it's all a misunderstanding and the cop wasn't waving him in. Yeah, and, and you know what? The corporate press piece is interesting of this because some of the people who are now they're not going after, there were members of the press that day in the field covering it as members of the press. But if they're part of the corporate press, somehow that was immune from investigation. You have independent journalists who are actually documenting what was happening are the ones that the Justice Department's now going after. Steve you have the likes of Owen Schroyer, who was actually yelling, as best I know, didn't even go in the Capitol, was on a <laughs> megaphone yelling 1776. I don't think that was a crime in this country. But apparently that was, by definition. They... And he ended up spending time, actually, unfortunately, under prosecution and under conviction. So I think it's a violation of the rule of law. I also think you haven't even gotten to the to the spicy stuff. But first of all, I want to say one thing. I'm glad that CNN, you know, at least took the approach they did. Or otherwise, we wouldn't be here doing this, actually. Right. Probably. You know, CNN, I did a town hall here in Iowa about, about maybe a month and a half ago where we started to talk to this woman, uh, Abby Phillips, who was monitoring the town hall. They literally cut it off five minutes early. Like, literally, it was supposed to be. There was a full time. There's a full run of show. By the time I start talking about January 6th, and there's only a few third rails that you really can't touch. But for whatever reason, this is one of them. They end the whole thing five minutes early, trot out a bunch of different experts explaining to their audience why everything they just heard was misinformation and needed to be debunked as dangerous for the future. Crazy. And then that's when they start calling us. And, and you know, they actually, uh, on YouTube, funny thing is, they threatened us with the cease and desist for putting up that town hall while Nikki Haley still sat up there for six months. I think part of it is, Tim, it's not just that it's less spicy for less clicks. I think there's something deeper and more ideological definitely going on here. Absolutely. That they believe it is their responsibility to make sure the public does not hear what, he, in this case here, are the facts of what happened. But even in other cases, viewpoints that are alternative to their own. I do think that's an important part of what's going on at the highest levels of these organizations. Well, well, this is the thing. We don't know a lot of the facts. How many FBI agents played a role in what happened? How many undercover police officers or other federal agencies participated in this event? Why did it take so long to respond? What just happened to Ray Epps and how was he able to get that kind of deal when there's so many people rotting away in solitary confinement right now? And you don't even have to go as far as to say it was an inside job or it wasn't an inside job. The burden of proof is on the government. The well, people have questions. We should demand answers. And I think we need a full investigation, not just of that event, 
But the uh, entire FBI, from, from its inception, That'd they be have great. been doing illegal, <laughs> horrible things to the American public. Lying, spying, destroying people's personal Black lives. Blackmailing. Blackmailing yep. individuals, including MLK. And mo more importantly, when you look at what, what happened specifically in 2001 in, in New York City, the FBI also played a major role in that incident that yep. they were never held accountable for. We need a full investigation into the FBI. Would that be something that you would support? Yes, but I think I have gained enough of an understanding of the FBI such that I can confidently say the correct answer is not to give them some new building or anything else. Oh, it yeah. is not to replace Christopher Ray, which is just a which is just a fake mirage. Get Christopher Ray out, you get James Comey 2.0. I'm convinced the right answer is to shut down the failed Bureau of Investigation, the FBI. Yes. That's the Amen. only answer that Amen. remains. Amen. Actually, That'd you guys amazing. are, you know, playing almost nicer with respect to the facts that we do have. As I said, you know, I agree that it appears to be an inside job, but we don't really know the full extent of what happened. I will say, though, it's interesting. I don't know if you guys have talked about this in the show before. I've kind of gone deep on this because I think it's important, not just for this incident, but for the future of the country. You know who the Detroit field office head was at the time of the alleged Gretchen Whitmer kidnapping plot? Are you guys... Is something you've talked about before or not really? I, I, I've I think, talked I think about we it have, but take it away. Yeah, so this, yeah. Is, this is important, though, to understand the nexus. It's kind of an underbelly in our law enforcement. So the Gretchen Whitmer kidnapping plot actually began as a plot to storm the Capitol in the state of Michigan. And you know how it started? It started with people at the FBI putting people up to this. Poor guys. One of them was actually supposedly getting hot water from a Mexican restaurant across the street. These are people who are not doing well in their life who they've put up and cultivated with $5,000 credit cards, with $5,000 limits to go buy munitions and otherwise, to initially what began as a plot to storm the Capitol, but eventually ended up being a plot to kidnap Gretchen Whitmer. A good number of the people who were captured here, like we're talking about a high proportion of them were absolutely federal informants. And yet the Detroit field office head, and they took that all the way to trial, several of the people at trial were, con were acquitted on grounds of entrapment. One of the jurors at the end went to one of the defendants, just gave him a hug and apologized for what he had been through because the juror actually had to see what the FBI put these people up to. And you can't make this stuff up. In October of 2020, three months before January of 2021, guess who gets a promotion to be the D.C. field office head? Was none other than that Detroit field office head. And what do you have on January 6, 2021, three months later, is a storming of the U.S. Capitol. Yep. So there's a lot here that suggests, I mean, the D.C. pipe bomb story at the DNC and the RNC headquarters. Why haven't we heard the first thing about what we actually know, despite the existence of video footage about that and the careful coincidence of exactly when that pipe bomb at the RNC headquarters happened to have been discovered with the timer on it down to the time where the actual vote was supposed to be cast for certifying the results of the election? It's, it's just so, an impossibility. That was the number one thing for me. I mean, yeah. the day after, and sorry to cut you off, but the day after January 6th. I was like, this is, this is complete set up by the FBI. I mean, if you mean to tell me that I was living in Washington, D.C. at the time, a couple of blocks away from the White House when January 6th happened. It was a very bizarre day because we had an entire summer I was in my room right of over people here. rioting. It was scary to go outside. I was pregnant at the time. Uh, cars set on fire. Every day there was a, a, a crazy protest, people storming buildings at all times. Suddenly, after the summer of love BLM, we were getting phone calls, people asking if we were okay after January 6th when there wasn't a any, any sounds outside of where I lived. If you mean to tell me that in Washington, D.C., where you can't walk two feet, it is the most surveilled building in the world, okay, that a couple of blocks away from the White House, they can't figure out where there, again, cameras on every single corner, every inch, who got out of their car, placed pipe bombs at the RNC and the DNC headquarters, right. and went away. And, and let me tell you how extensive their search was, because this is something that people are not talking about, because you, you're talking about people that stood trial, and of course, that's the most important, the people that are being locked up, people that have committed suicide. Let's not forget to talk about people that have killed themselves mm -hmm. for fear of being locked up yeah. because they showed up to support <laughs> the sitting president of the United States. I have two friends from Stanford, Connecticut, who showed up to hear Donald Trump speak and went home, okay? That was it. They never went into the Capitol building, nothing. After the speech, they didn't go up. FBI agents showed up at their house. This was a harassment and intimidation campaign that took place. Mm -hmm. If you even showed up to support President Trump, they got questioned. They got questioned. They, were, they found a picture of them on Facebook with a MAGA flag. They heard Trump speak and they went home 
and these people were questioned by the feds. Mm -hmm. So they had the enough resources, right, yep. to send them out and hunt down people that were posting pictures, but they but can't enough. find out <laughs> who just tried to blow up headquarters in Washington, D.C., a couple of blocks away from the White House. And you want right. to know what the weirdest part about this is, and I'm just, as I go deeper learning facts about this, is Kamala Harris, the number two, for, for better or worse, to, to succeed the U.S. president, was at the DNC headquarters that morning with all coming, I mean, the level of security there that understand then suddenly then randomly they just see it on a park bench later. So I think there's enough facts here to know the government has not been transparent with us. But furthermore, we know Capitol Police officers will let him in. We know that the video footage was success was selectively released. Yep. Such that you did not see shooting rubber bullets and tear gas into the mostly peaceful crowd. You saw the reaction of those people hidden capital after releasing that, and then you did not see initially Capitol Police officers allowing peaceful in, pe people in peacefully. Yeah, we didn't see any of that. It's a distortion, that. and we just deserve the truth. Nothing well, I have, I have a question until recently. You. So I've, I've often talked about the May 29th insurrection. May 29th, 2020, thousands mm. of far-left extremists stormed the barricades of the White House, fought with hundreds, if not uh, several hundred, police officers injuring around between 70 and 140. They firebombed the White House grounds. That's true. They, they set fire to a guard tower, and they set fire to St. John's Church. This is a historical church the founding fathers would go to. It was so severe that the president was forced into his emergency bunker, thus disrupting his official duties. And, really? Yes. Wow. And my question is, why? where was our commission? Where, where was the, uh, I mean, the photos of that day? When, uh, you know, I go to family gatherings over the holidays and I show a photo of an aerial shot of D.C., which many of you may have seen, smoke rising out all around the White House and the surrounding areas from fires that were being lit. Mm -hmm. The president was forced into an emergency bunker against his will, and the media made fun of him and called him Bunker Boy for having had to experience this. Mm -hmm. Yep. Donald Trump said, I, I went down, they, they showed me, and he clearly didn't want to be there. When law enforcement then cleared out the extremists who had laid siege to the White House, I'm being purposefully hyperbolic, you understand why. Donald Trump came out the next day and took a picture and they attacked him and insulted him for having defended the White House and a church that was set on fire by extreme, an extremist faction. A faction so extreme, in fact, that similar groups and, and cells within the same ideology had seized several blocks in various cities, in Atlanta, in Seattle, in their, their Capitol Hill occupation, and in Minnesota with George Floyd Square. Yeah. Videos emerged out of, uh, I believe it was Seattle, of armed groups walking around with AR-15s pointing them at drivers. People of a similar or same ideology, in fact, many of these people do coordinate, yep. engaged in insurrection. Yep. Now, of course, we can calm down and say a bunch of extremist activists riding in the streets, no insurrection. Oh, fair point. Then neither was the Capitol. Well, what about yep. Brett Kavanaugh? Was anybody alive for the Brett Kavanaugh hearings? Do you remember them storming in, going into senators' offices? Does it, I mean, I'm telling you, D.C. was insane, and nobody cared until January 6th happened. This was like a routine thing. So for those of you who are uh, kind of like, okay, well, I, I, it was clearly a riot. Yeah, but here's, here's the thing. What we have to do is, if, if we're going to call something anything, whatever we're going to label it as, it needs to be consistent across the board. So if it happens for the Democrats, then it's a riot and or, you know, to take the next step, whatever we, we want to label it as. So whatever happens has to be consistent across the board in the event that it only gets applied one way. We have to start not accepting the definition only on one side. That's the reality. We have to start asking questions and saying, if this is what this is, and we have to make the statement, then all of this is bad. The 2020 riots, problematic. So that's what they're talking about here. It's got to be consistent. This was not some small joke. This was significant in terms of the number of people, in terms of I mean, some of the video footage the mainstream media picked out. But I think what's significant about it is we don't know what actually caused those people to act the way they, they did. Was it really the government instigating something that otherwise didn't exist, using it as a deflection to achieve a national security state's revival that had otherwise receded over the course of 20 years since the post 9-11 period? And so maybe I've just told you what I actually think is going on here. But that's what I think the facts suggest is there was 
a reason to, for these people to not only get Donald Trump out of office, but to discredit this, to relegate this line of thinking, the movement behind him, to the dustbins of history. And this was the way to do it. So I think that there was a lot of depth to this. And it wasn't just that, okay, well, like this was, I mean, these are two different standards, two different bad things. Yes. But this was, I think, a very serious forethought exercise in accomplishing something. And unless we see through it, first step when you see a problem is to name it. Unless we do that, they are going to accomplish what they set out to accomplish. That's yep. what I believe. I'd like to jump to some breaking news from today, and then we'll get into some core issues that are happening. We've got stories on immigration. There's a school in New York that they, they, they told the kids to go remote. You can't use a school anymore because illegal immigrants are coming in. We have a breaking story from James O'Keefe where he actually tracked down buses engaged in human trafficking, and they flee from them. It's really interesting. But we'll start with this story from our good friends at The New York Times. Christie caught on hot mic disparaging Haley and DeSantis. Now, the interesting thing here is, of course, that he dropped <laughs> Not out. Not surprising. But we also have this hot mic moment I want to play and get your thoughts on. Uh, uh, hopefully this, it, will this play properly? I mean, I mean, I hope so. Let's play it. I can hear it down here. Is there a way to get it to play on the speakers? There is no way to get it to play on the speakers? Not right now. I can't even hear it on the headphones. Okay, well, I understand we can't play this. It. This is my first time doing we know a live stream. I've, yeah, so. I've, I've heard it. We've heard, <laughs> it. heard it. We've all heard it. So I want to clarify some things because in the tweet that went uh, initially, that started getting a lot of play, it's got half a million so far, it says, Chris Christie says, Nikki Haley is, quote, going to get smoked, and you and I both know it. She's not up to this. In regards to Trump, Christie says, Ron DeSantis called him up petrified. Now, what Christie says is, Ron called me petrified that I was going to, or something like that, and then cuts off. Someone else then intervenes and says... He's probably getting out after Iowa. I personally do not believe Ron drops out after Iowa. No. But I'm curious. There's a few things. Candace, you actually made a really good point about this, if you want to. So when I was sitting down, and I, I think I actually said this on my podcast, but during the, the first Republican debates, it was the energy going into it was essentially that DeSantis was going to have to come out and say stuff against Vivek, obviously, because Vivek was having a surge in the polls. And interestingly enough, he didn't say anything to Vivek, but then suddenly Chris Christie just went like an attack dog. Um, and I just thought it was really odd. I was like, if, if this feels strangely coordinated to me. I feel like Chris Christie and Ron DeSantis are maybe friends and they're all friends and they all know that this is the guy that they have to attack. I felt this, I said this in my podcast, and then I thought it was really interesting that DeSantis called him petrified about whatever it is. I just thought to myself, why is DeSantis calling Chris Christie at all? Do they have a relationship? Again, these are just questions. We probably are not going to get the answer to them as they're no already idea. working Good on question. spin and saying that DeSantis was just calling to you know, bid him farewell from the race or something. Petrified. Well, yeah, De DeSantis petrified. was petrified that Christie would do something. Right. We don't know what he was going to do, but that's according to Chris Christie. I'm curious as to why they were in conversation at, at all. all. Yeah. And, and why DeSantis <laughs> would express to him his, his fear over something Christie might do. I haven't talked to either today. I can tell you that. And so so, <laughs> so I'll, I'll tell you something. I think that there's something deeper going on, and this is today a footnote. It's a footnote, but a footnote in the deeper game that's hiding in plain sight. I think, Ian, you said, oh, is this all just one giant deep fake? I actually think it is. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I think we're witnessing a deep fake in real time. And the deep fake is this. And, and the people who are the subjects to it, I think every one of the people who is a subject to it, for better or worse, is falling for the deep fake, which is that this system, the system, has made a decision, the same one that they thought they were making back when Donald Trump was exiting office, Okay, they didn't get it right that time around to make a decision that this man shall not be allowed anywhere near the White House again, period. That's exactly They happening. will stop at nothing. And at this point, I really mean nothing to keep this man out of the White House. So what are they trying to do? I was trying to figure out for a long time. It didn't feel like it was going to be a Trump versus Biden race. There's a lot with Biden. you got the documents case coming out. Why are they trotting that against Biden after like 10 years? Hunter Biden, okay, we could have talked about it. Now suddenly it's gaining credibility. Didn't feel like it was going to be Biden. And so I think incorrectly assumed that it was going to be Gavin Newsom or somebody else as the new puppet other than Biden they want to trot out. And I think what became increasingly clear is that they've actually found a much more convenient new puppet, a puppet who actually can give them a lot of air cover by being within the Republican Party or the guise of the Republican Party itself. And that's Nikki Haley, of course. The very people oh. who are paying to keep Trump <laughs> off the ballot in lawsuits yeah. like Reid Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, or even Larry Fink, the king of the woke industrial complex, the leader of BlackRock. Look at who they're supporting. It's not Gavin Newsom. It's not Joe Biden. It's Nikki Haley, actually. And so what they want to do, to put it in plain sight, is to make this a two-horse race between Donald Trump and a puppet who they can control. I believe that's Nikki Haley. 
eliminate Trump from contention. I don't know if I'd say that. And then that. trot in their controllable puppet into the White House. I'd that's say, the game that's hiding in plain sight. She's I think clearly a neocon. Falling, like, she actually. is not I don't think they're falling for it. I think it's very um, it's odd every time we look at the polls or... I, the, I wouldn't the say that she's a deliberate tool Nikki of is surging, the, And it's so obvious if you speak to people uh, that she's not. After left, every single debate, they're like, Nikki won, uh, Nikki won. Even when it's so obvious. She's not even third place in yeah. terms of who won. And they're trying to convince us. It's every time. Yeah. a full propaganda effort Absolutely. when it comes to Nikki Haley. And you're right. Um, I think the it's pretty sinister for, what they're doing. But the people... I don't think are falling for the only part that I'm worried the people are falling for is some idea that this system is literally going to somehow stop short of literally stopping at nothing to keep Donald Trump away from the White House. You think is it Trump or is it the what he represents, the methodologies that he's used, like canceling the Trans-Pacific Partnership kind of isolationist mentality? Yes, but it's really I think the third rails there are definitely foreign policy. I think ending the war in Ukraine on the terms that either I or Trump have suggested definitely hits the third rail. I think the preservation of the national security state is a third rail. Those are the two big ones. The preservation of the national security bureaucracy at home. You can talk about the anti-woke stuff, the transgender stuff. Yeah, I mean, we have disagreements on the partisan basis, but that's all fine. It's mostly a deflection, actually. It's almost a convenient fact that Nikki Haley occasionally gets to say things that pay homage to the anti-woke movement. I don't think she has actual beliefs, but at least it's part of the cover. The real third rails are foreign policy. Keep the interventionist, neoliberal, neoconservative worldview of the U.S. as the hegemon that actually gets people to cut in on the rake here at home, the likes of the John Boltons and the Nikki Haley's. Right. And then third rail is the national security state at home. But I think in Donald Trump's case, I think that they've, they've convinced themselves that with this man in particular, he is so dangerous to the future. He's demonstrated himself to be, their words, you know, their, their view, not mine, that they have to and have a moral duty to this country. And when you believe you have a moral duty to do something, then you're bound by your more subordinate moral constraints. Because there's the everyday moral, moral norms you operate you Trump against. Trump off the ballot, about lawsuits, lawsuits like Reed Hoffman, of humanity or a nation, then those ordinary constraints no longer apply. And I think that's the mode the system is now in. The ordinary constraints are, okay, you let people on a ballot. Not anymore. You don't prosecute people for made-up crimes, especially in the middle of a presidential election. Not anymore. And if they've ratcheted up each of those times and none of those things work, I just think eventually they're just going to stop at nothing, whatever it takes to take Trump out after they've narrowed it down to a two-horse race between Trump and Haley, which in turn is why I'm in this till the very end. And I think that we have a responsibility to this country to make sure that that plot doesn't play out. They're selling us the rope today that they'll use to hang us tomorrow. That's what's happening. And I don't want yep. people in, in our movement to fall for the other part of this to somehow think that that actually... Yeah, Dakota, I, I agree. Spirit. This, it's uh, not about being so – she's too conservative for her left. Where someone mutters, yeah. Ron's probably getting out after Iowa. Let's imagine this scenario, that Ron actually decides for whatever happens in Iowa, his showing wasn't good enough, and it's time to end this race. The worst possible thing imaginable would be you then leaving the race as well because it would by default give us either Trump or Haley. And I'm definitely not, exactly, and for that reason. That's a nightmare scenario. But, you know, look, I think, you know, I, mean, I have my own views. I think we're going to deliver a major surprise here in Iowa. We can talk about that separately. I think we're going to shock Woo. the system, and the vibes on the ground are very good. But as part of the 50,000-foot view here, I actually think if you play this out intuitively, it feels like the next step in the game among the corporate candidates is Ron would make a good vice president for Nikki, Right. Christie out of the way is one footnote yeah. today. All right. Eliminate part of the consolidation in New Hampshire. Christie's not running for president of the United States ever. He was arguably running for like vice president of New Hampshire. But anyway, once he exited, we'll actually combine that in to prop up Nikki a little bit more. The next thing is you take the Ron DeSantis. Ron DeSantis is not in New Hampshire so much, but in certain other states, Florida or otherwise, turn that over as well to the anti-Trump movement. I don't think Ron knows that. I think if people asked Ron DeSantis, he would say, of course, I would not be Nikki's vice president. And I think inside him, he probably would believe that that's actually what he thinks. But that almost pretends that what he thinks actually matters. Mm. His donors are the ones that put him up to run for president in the first place. I don't think the man on his own volition, I think there are other people who put him up to run for president at a time where it didn't make for sense for him to do it. The same people are going to put him up to be Nikki's vice president. So you play this forward, that's yep. where this goes. Final step, take Trump out of contention, trot the corporate puppets into office. That's where this plot ends. And I feel like I see this with a level of clarity that makes it torturous it's like a kind of form of torture to watch this playing out in real time without yeah, standing yeah. up and actually doing something you, about you, it. let me, let me real, real quick just to get it in there scenario donald trump wins the primary he said he, he he comes right on out and says vivek ramaswamy you are my vice president what do you say donald trump wins the you're saying donald trump wins the primary and then that so i think we just have to have an honest conversation i mean if, if that's the scenario we're in 
That's not what I'm playing for. But if that's Chief what of we're staff. in. Chief of staff. I have an inconvenient attribute, which is that I have opinions. VP does nothing. I have strong opinions about things. I'm not somebody who really you know, rolls over or whatever. But what I've said is Donald Trump has my full support if he's the nominee. And I expect his full support if I'm the nominee. But I don't think we get to that place. That's the whole premise of, of I mean, when you think it's Gavin Newsom or Joe Biden as the puppet, you think you might get to that place. Not sure, Dakota. I don't, I don't think know. they want Biden or Newsom. I think Nikki is a far more reliable pawn for the system with respect to the two things they care about most, which is keeping the foreign war machine humming, far more reliable on places from the Middle East to Ukraine. She's far more hawkish than actually anybody in the Democratic side. And with respect to the national security state, I don't think Joe Biden could have come up with the idea if he tried to tie every social media account and internet account with a government-issued ID. So I don't think it goes there, Tim. I think where it goes is they want this late in the primary, and then they get the air cover, because the Democratic Party's brand isn't doing too hot. The permanent state is fundamentally nonpartisan at its core. So they get the air cover of saying, oh, yeah, we weren't even, we weren't even doing the Democrat game where, where most of the Republican base watching cable news thinks it's about beating Biden. They're missing the plot. That's what's going on. That's actually a really great point. We were talking just the other day. There was yeah. a story, a J.P. Morgan top strategist, I'm sure you heard, said his prediction is that Joe Biden drops out just after Super Tuesday due to a health issue. <clears throat> I view that as a very, very good strategy for Democrats. I had been saying for some time that I believe Joe Biden will drop out. His health is just not there. His polling is not there. It is political suicide. Absolutely. However, many people pointed out He's... in our chats and in our audience that it's too late to have a primary. There's nothing they can do. Actually, that sounds like the best play. Joe Biden says, I'm running. No primary to be had. Don't worry about it. Come March, he says, oh, no, my ailing heart. This gives the DNC the ability to just appoint who is going to be their nominee. Which they can do. However, I They're think you actually make delicates. a much better point. Why even worry about going into a political conflict with Donald Trump and the, and the, and the populist Republican base yes. when you can win from within exactly. Haley? And that's exactly what's going on. And also, they, that, have, they have this... Ailing that's, Kamala that's Harris the first time I've really heard. If anything other than Kamala Harris concept. is the nominee, then they got the racist, I don't think you know, misogynist thing going on, which underlies, which undermines their own self-stated narrative. I, I have no. There's no way. Yes, could there be underlying things that they consistently are on par with? Because you know, Nikki Haley is a neocon. Sure, but that concept is too conspiracy theory for me. Like, yeah. Uh, the idea that they that they're they've got a they've they got this planned and you know it, it's on the inside, the Democrats can't can't work that way with with anybody on the right. They, it's anathema, right? And it would be happenstance. It's kind of like the deep state concept where it's not inherently the people who are the ones uh, entirely coordinating. It's because their worldviews are similar and they take actions that overlay each other and coordinate. And so that's one of the things that I think is, is what this would be it, not a deliberate coordination. Major airline boarding passes that state no name given. This was bro This story was broken uh, by Ashley St. Clair. It uh, we're still waiting on, on vetting and development. So by all means, Anyone in the press who wants to doubt this story, you feel free to do so. But I will put my reputation on the line and say I have uh, Dakota. A neocon isn't like a new conservative. Neo means new conservative con for conservative. Uh, and so and it's really a, it's another word kind of for rhino, um, but it involves conservatism. And it's where we're no longer conserving anything in the conservative party because we've we've dropped all the traditional things that make that reality um traditional and we're still considering ourselves conservatives and so um that that's the new term to kind of encapsulate more than just a re republican like rhino it encapsulates conservative traditional values that are going um un uh, unferried into the future by new generations of people who still claim the title conservative conservatives and this and this video is, is, is it's it's crazy. They follow a bus carrying yeah. these illegal immigrants. The bus tries to hit them. The bus tries fleeing and swerving through the road, going on and off exits, trying to lose them because journalists are following them and then actually stops and does not release its passengers and then leaves again. Something about what they're doing has them scared. Someone will find out they're doing it. But I'll give you one quick story that happened to me personally. 
Outside of this, you know, Ashley St. Clair uh, showed me the materials. It's a boarding pass that says no name given. Do you want to board an, a, a major airliner with people? Our security, our TSA has no idea who these people are, where they come from. I was in Chicago over the holiday. She's got the we receipts, too. We flew on a private jet. How about that? It's, not, it's really fun, isn't it? And our shuttle bus driver said the other day, a 737 came in, and we were told by our bosses that it was the Blackhawks. How fun is that? So, oh, you're going you're gonna to get to go service a plane, pull out the luggage for a famous hockey team. He said when they pulled up to the plane and opened it up, there were three garbage bags in the forward, uh, in the forward cargo hold. That's it. No luggage, nothing. They then found out that the entire plane, 140 passengers, were illegal immigrants, and he said it was Swift Air. I don't know. That's what he told me. I asked him, did they lie to you? claiming it was the Blackhawks because you would not have served that plane had you known you'd be facilitating illegal immigration. And he went, bingo, exactly. So my question now is with all of this news breaking, and this is a massive story, mm. I'm interested in your view on what's going on. I want to know how you plan to handle it, what you would do. And I also want to know your position on how do we handle the fact that there are federal law enforcement officers actually facilitating this? Yeah, well, I think it's, again, one of these when it was, comes to the media, third rail issues, when you name what's going on, so forget the labels, great replacement theory, whatever, just forget the labels. What's going on is, what's the most parsimonious explanation is, there is a facilitation of mass illegal migration into the United States to secure lasting electoral majorities for the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. And the reason you know that's not a conspiracy theory is it is a pestated strategy of Democrats dating back to about 10 years ago. There's a real that And it's not a surprise when you got Mayorka sitting by Joe Biden's side about 10 years ago, the guy who's actually running the Department of Homeland Security right now, who is in turn refusing to enforce the Remain in Mexico policies. Yes, that's exactly what's going on and hiding in plain sight. And the math makes sense. It works. So now you have AOC coming in for cover in recent days, what this is yesterday or the day before, saying that actually the right solution isn't building the wall, but to document the undocumented, which is the next step to them participating in those elections. And so it's... If somebody tells you this is what I'd like to do, then they take actions consistent with achieving what they'd like to do and then consummate it by actually doing that very thing in changing the composition of the electorate and translating into who en actually ends up voting in elections. You tend to believe that that's the most parsimonious explanation, not something else that we're otherwise struggling to figure out how to solve. Well, once we figure out how to solve that, we realize it's not a technical problem. I think, and sometimes it's what bothers me in a lot of the border discussions is people get into some sort of and I've done this, too. I'll get into technical details. You know, do we need aquatic barriers in the Rio Grande? What do we think about the airlines? How should they be conforming the standards to the other people at the TSA, the thousands standing around, as I call them, at the airport? Or, or what are they doing? Yeah, 82,000 are watching this. 83 right now. Actually eliminate the intention. YouTube. It's crazy. Get the intentions in the right place. Say our intention is for people who enter this country illegally to not be in this country. Technically, it becomes actually a very easy challenge to solve. Militarize the southern border. We're militarizing other people's borders. Yep. How about militarizing our own with our own military? Militarize our border as we are doing Novel and should not be doing for others. Use the aquatic barriers in the Rio Grande. Stop giving money to Central America. Most of the people coming through Mexico, 80% of them didn't start in Mexico. Require each of those countries to build a border barricade all the way from Venezuela to the southern border of Texas. And birthright citizenship for kids of illegals. The 14th yep. Amendment does not apply to the kids of illegals. I can go to the legal argument on this. They duped Donald Trump on this one. They said you need a constitutional amendment. Actually, you don't. Stop federal funding for sanctuary cities. We're paying for this. Our federal taxpayer money is actually paying for this facilitation of the domestic transfer to sanctuary cities. And then anybody in this country should be returned to their country of origin if you're here illegally. It's that, it's that simple. Now, they say there's only 6,000 ICE agents, Immigrations and Customs Enforcement Agents, well, again, if you read the law, there's a section in the law, I think it's 287G or something like this, that, that allows ICE agents to serve their warrants via local law enforcement. You just need, again, somebody running, ideally the entire executive branch, a president who tells the Department of Homeland Security and ICE to use that authority to work with local law enforcement. Now you've got a million people, not just 6,000, to get the job done. So I gave you all of this as though the technical challenge was really the challenge. It's not. It's a challenge of intention. Right. right now, there's been a longstanding intention to fundamentally change the composition of the U.S. electorate. If you call that a great replacement theory, CNN will, CNN will have a uh, conniption. If you say that, you know what, this is part of an electoral strategy, they would ask you what's so wrong with that. But either way, we got to at least air what it actually is 
to be able to have a debate whether this is desirable policy or not. But, but, but if you say if you like it and if you support uh, people coming in and replacing the local population, you of course get promoted by the corporate media. Yeah. There's, there's, there's crazy <laughs> stats out there talking about how there's more illegals brought into the United States than actual babies born inside of this country. This is, to me, the weaponization of human trafficking, the introduction of the third world into the United States that's going to create a super elitist Uber class and a poor poverty everyone else class. This is far beyond just even a great replacement. This is, this is a, a, a essentially the destruction of this country from within. How can we roll this back? How can we go back from hundreds of thousands of people coming into this country in such a weaponized millions way? of people? Yep. Well, you can draft them into the military. <laughs> I mean, what? Send the, them to Ukraine. Huh? Because the idea of mass deport deportations is like a storybook. Nazi Germany visage like I can see the images of like newly deputized ice agents like a 19 year old cop going and like grabbing some woman and pulling her out of her house and her screaming as the baby's lying on the ground like the world will not tolerate it even our own country as much as I'm not saying that deportations the, are are off the table but that's Ian's the like imagery that would be swung hippie. with something like that He's so what do you do Funny send them, guy, to, send them uh, into the well. army go let them earn their citizenship not by Christian, fighting in the Ukraine I don't know what the plan is he, the only thing I would say about guy. that is one is I do favor in substance doing this as humanely and respectfully as possible in substance largely because for many of these people it's not necessarily their fault right if you're sitting in Honduras or wherever and you got a U.S. president, an entire apparatus that's giving you a wink and a nod to come on over. Who knows? Maybe if many of us were in their shoes, we would have done the same thing, especially we're parents of children who want better lives for our children. So I just think it's the yeah, right thing to do for this crazy? country because we're a nation Dakota. founded on the rule of law. More that's not something that's necessarily babies, hostile uh, to most of those millions are not otherwise birth innately birth bad people. But these are people, regardless of whether they're good people or bad people, we're a nation founded on the rule and of law. Seen amount of people coming so out of the I can't... So. With my level of sort of moral clarity on this, I can't be a father of two sons in the White House, tell them they have to follow the rules when I'm leading a U.S. government that actively isn't following its own rules. And so I think as respectfully and humanely as possible, we have to return them to their country of origin. But Ian, there's a philosophical point here, too, which is I think once we fall into the trap as leaders of trying to make decisions based on how we fear they will be portrayed – then we're done making the right decisions and we're just down 100%. the road of actually dancing to what we think we're going to be portrayed as. And it becomes circular. Whereas I think the job of a good leader is to do what is right. Listen and when the public board, does not agree with you, to persuade them of the fact that that was still the right government. thing to do. I, I do think the public uh, are, are now very aware of the problem that's happening right now. I'm, I'm totally comfortable with mass deportations. I could definitely stomach watching mass deportations happen. I mean... <laughs> We've been forced to stomach watching it happen the other way. I don't know if I'm broken on the inside, but I mean, reading these stories about people that you know can't afford groceries and yet are having to watch buses and schools emailing them saying, hey, don't come in today because we've decided to give the school that you've been funding for years with your tax dollars to illegal immigrants so they could sleep. I feel bad for those people. You know oh. what I mean? I feel bad for the American people <laughs> that are looking at the are suffering at the gas pump, suffering, suffering at the grocery stores and constantly being told by the left that you need to feel bad for someone else somewhere more than you feel bad for yourself. I think it's time for Americans to get a little bit more selfish in that regard and, and stop. And I, 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 I think they will do. I think we're, we're suffering enough now that people are going to. Yeah, I, you got to militarize the border. There should be. I mean, this is I don't hear this enough in the yep. rhetoric, but there should be machine gun nests pointing outward away from our borders saying. And, but then what you need is a leader at the top that's not waving people in, because if they're waving people in, no, no, no machine gun nest. That's not, we're not going to do that. But if, I, I think that unless you tell them to stop coming, and I mean, you do it with more than just your words, that it's not, the problem isn't going to Well, well I, 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 I appreciate what I would describe as Ian's big ask. <laughs> and now we're going to walk way back from machine gun nests on the border to, like, maybe a fence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A fence it's, would it's be a good start. Uh, you you stay as authoritarian. <laughs> it's, it's, it's more about not incentivizing this from, from happening. I mean, giving— But seriously, guys, seriously, everywhere else in the world, justly, by the way, protects their borders militarily. Like, you get shot, potentially, for entering into someone's country illegally or— you get jailed and sent right back and uh, potentially fined. I mean, there's so many different things that happen to you in foreign countries. And it's just, it's just to protect our borders, borders like this. 
And so I'm not entirely opposed to militarizing it to the point where we're putting machine gun nests on there because ultimately part of deterrence is the psychological side of it. It's like, geez, I don't know know if they're going to use those things. That should be part of it. You should go. Do not test us. Come in legally or else. And even if you don't flex that um, fully, there needs to be some intimidation factor. And and there isn't. There isn't anything. As a matter of fact, there's only greener greener pastures because of how we've made it in today's immigration policy which is an immigration policy it's breaking the law policy so that i'm i'm for that you to believe nobody wants these jobs as they give them away and drop the prices and i gotta say it is these large multinational corporations that know they can pay people under the table dirt wages and this is how they this is how they, this right. how they get cheap labor i, I just want to say one thing to, to ian's point from earlier I, th- I think it's important to understand what's going on like on the ground in the southern border. Have have any of you guys been to no, the southern border? No, I, I should. I have. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. actually, yeah. you have. Yeah. So I, I think that, that probably affects your yeah. view, Candace. It definitely affects mine, having been there. Don't want to get kidnapped by the uh, it's cartel. It's not like you have this situation where illegal migrants or whatever are trying to cross the Rio Grande, sneak across, get a sprint, and then do you shoot them or not? It's not one of those situations. It's organized. By our own government, it's facil- It's actually what was striking about it is there's a lot of things in life that are pretty disorganized. Like starting a startup company is pretty disorganized. You guys, you guys maybe have a similar enterprise here that you started from. That's why you I've seen, should you know, a lot of things that are good in life are disorganized. Startup. That's what I. This is not disorganized. This is striking because of startup, how markedly organized it actually is. There's design. a process. They give you forms. DM me. Here's the box you check. You don't have to know English. They'll just tell you which box to check. Seeking asylum. Do you have to show proof? of political persecution to get asylum. Not at all. It's just a procedure you go through. You know exactly go from point A to point B to point C. And so part of militarizing the southern border is the signal that we send, because that's the signal we're sending right now. Not only coming in, but then you show up to Sanctuary City. You get you get baby formula. You get sneakers, $7,000 per migrant per month, converting South Shore High School on the south side of Chicago into an encampment for migrants. So I think part of what we're doing is offering a clear statement. We end federal funding for Sanctuary Cities. You know in advance that if your child is born in the United States, they're not going to actually enjoy citizenship. 100%. Oh, there's a, there's a wall and a fence and people wearing camo because they serve in the U.S. military facing outward. I'll never have the military carrying out domestic law enforcement functions, but facing outward against what currently is an organized invasion into our country. That's, I think, what's going on. And so this idea of, yeah, guys with guns and do you shoot or not, it's just like just it's just not even close to what's happening right now. And I think part of this is goes back to it's not the technicals that matter. It's a statement of intention. And if, if you really if that you really don't think it's that bad, you really need to just go watch the news and not apparently the news you're watching. It, it is so bad. Hundreds of thousands of people in a week. And there's no logistics for them. And I'm sorry, the amount of draw that is, it, it, you have to come in legally. It has to be planned. Sorry, you can't just show up unannounced anywhere, anywhere in any other context and expect to be catered to. That's not how it works. And I'm sorry, the America cannot be the caterer, no matter for everyone else's trauma that's going on in the world. You've got to deal with your own crap and the Lord be with you. And America can help you out when it comes to philanthropy, people getting involved in ministry down there in, in difficult countries. But sorry, you can't just flee your homeland, come right in here and expect to be catered to um, without proper redressive process. Uh, that's a recipe for not only your detriment, the detriment of everyone else that you're seeking asylum in, because it's going to collapse their economy. It's going to collapse their ability to do, get work, all sorts of things. So it's not it's not possible to maintain what we are currently doing without significant problems. And there are, we already have significant problems. We can't keep things as we are on the border. I yeah. mean, I feel nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I look, look, <laughs> let, let me, let me stress. I, 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 I have good people with to turn on their neighbors and be like, I think he's illegal. It's and not, that kind of, it's, it's, yeah. We're not talking about that. But look, there, humans can do bad things. I have, I actually have a tremendous amount of respect for people who are willing to traverse miles through desert dozens or hundreds or thousands of miles because the dream of America is so incredible. 
But it's got to be a legal process. But yeah. it's not even the dream that's being sold to them anymore. It's just the idea, it, it, you're being offered free stuff now. You know what I mean? This is not the American stuff. dream, and I'm suffering so much in this country, and I'm willing to traverse through the desert uh, for an opportunity. Yeah, talk like to the said, real people it is who now came systematic. over here legally. You are going to have a better life. As soon as you get here, it's all set up for you. You know, I met a journalist that found the dumping point where they're being told to dump all of their IDs. They're coming in on flights from other countries, dumping their IDs because they're being told to. She had three bags filled with their IDs. Yep. And then they were handed these pamphlets from the UN, by the way, which was beyond bonkers. She showed me this pamphlet that was coming from the UN. And they're being told to do this to come into this country because they know that there are politicians that are setting up an entire system for them where their lives will be better. So this oh. is not the same, the same mentality. People that are coming at the border right now, we have to let go of this idea that they're just these suffering people who are willing to do anything for an opportunity. They're just being offered handouts one of the, at the expense of the and American people. it's like an people. assembly line to bring them in. Yeah, free health care and free, uh, sec- free right, gender so, changes. Yeah, so. I'll, lottery I'll, I'll use it as a segue. One of the things I've heard uh, quite a bit, many people back uh, in my hometown, Chicago, have said, I can't afford to pay the rent. My groceries are too expensive. We just went to Hy-Vee, grocery store out here. It, it was great. But yeah, it was expensive. I mean, uh, we, we got, I got three things of salami. I always love buying salami and cheese dip. <laughs> uh, a couple things of heavy whipping cream with our coffee. Four grocery bags, it was 300, 300 bucks. To be fair, we got some vitamins and some protein powder. I know there's a little bit more expensive, but I was surprised to see this little bit was so much. And I hear people say, why are, in Chicago particularly, when I went and visited home, they're, giving these, they're paying these people rent, they're putting them in hotels, they're giving them our schools, they're getting a free pass from our tax dollars and I can't afford to pay rent, right. I can't afford yep. to survive. So part of the, the immigration issue that many people are feeling is the economic hit they're taking. We're paying taxes that are supporting all of these, these, these flights where they're bringing in hundreds or thousands. These buses, they're being paid for yes. by the American taxpayer while the American taxpayer suffers and can't afford to pay rent. Yeah, and I think actually that's what makes this a nonpartisan issue. This should, have, should be a slam dunk issue for us. So I it was your hometown Chicago. I didn't realize that. I visited the south side of Chicago earlier in this campaign, which is a very Wait, traditional campaign. South Shore? South Shore. Yep. I don't know. A couple of different areas, too, but we went to South Shore Midway. High School is where we finished the day. And uh, Oh, really? That's where you grew up? Midway Airport. Oh, Two nice. blocks away. All right. Well, hmm. uh, good well. deep dish pizza and all that. Mm. You know, we, we, yeah, you get, <laughs> it's get, called soup. There's, there's some things to like. Well, that's the tourist stuff. Art Come of on. pizza. Check yeah, it out. I mean, I, but, I, but that's what I am when I go. I mean, we, 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 <laughs> we, don't, we don't get to go to Chicago every day, so we pick some on the way out. But, you know, it was interesting where it was a room full, you know, maybe like this one. A little bit different ethnic composition. It was you know, 95% black. 150% Democrat, as they told me before you went. Maybe that's how they count their votes. But, but anyway, it was interesting, right? The, the first part of the exchange was contentious because some people came with some questions that were, I think there were some people who had some real animus to me in that room. One woman, she asked me a question, walked straight out because she didn't like my answer on racial reparations. But actually things changed pretty quickly when we got to the question of illegal mass migration, where they're literally converting the local high school into an encampment for migrants at a cost of $7,000 per migrant per month when the people in that community, Americans, are asking the question, what about me? Right. And actually later it came up. Somebody else asked me on their own. I wasn't bringing bringing up foreign policy. Why are we sending our money to Ukraine? Almost challenging me like I was a person who would, presumably because being a Republican or whatever, believe that this was a good idea. And I explained that, no, 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 this is actually a very bad idea. We should not be doing this. And we actually left with a lot of common ground on both of those issues. Which is why I think it's actually very important not yeah, to see the America First movement through the prism questions. of even yeah. the Republican Party. Yeah, you'll the go Republican to Southside Party means Chicago. That's a good one, actually. It doesn't actually. mean anything to be a Republican. Well, it doesn't Chicago predict Chicago what you mean based on foreign that? policy. It doesn't predict what you think about free speech. It doesn't predict what you think about national security state overreach. So that label means a lot less. But I think that because of what you just said, people, I mean, it's expensive right now. People are struggling in this country. This is something that should cross partisan lines, racial lines. I think there's an opportunity for us to deliver a landslide election in 2024 <laughs> and a landslide Iraq. minus some shenanigans <laughs> is still a win, yeah. which, you know, I think is something we have to prepare for. And that's kind of my whole MO in this thing. I saw several polls. Many of you may have seen them. Uh, the youth vote swinging towards Donald Trump. That's pretty shocking. But I have to imagine if, uh, uh, you know, from where I grew up in Chicago, I've got my relatives talking about, they're, they're talking about building physical encampments, taking a whole area in the South Side and building a camp from scratch. I remember when I was 16, I got my first paycheck. Doesn't everybody remember that? 
and you're like, I was supposed to get paid, you know, eight bucks an hour. I worked X amount of hours. And then you look at your check and you're like, where's yeah. my money? And then all the older guys laugh and they were like, look at the tax section. It's called theft. Now imagine, that's that. right. Now imagine 16, 17, 18 year old kids working their first, or first job or whatever, get that first paycheck. They see how much money is taken from them, from their hard labor. They, they, they work their, their fingers to the bone. And then at the same time, on the news, your tax dollars, $7,000 per person per month. We're talking about $84,000 a year for free to people who are not from this country, who have not worked for this country. And you, hardworking young man, have a third of your income taken by the government to give to them. And maybe it's because we have a $34 mm. trillion dollar national surplus to spend on this. No, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's actually a $34 trillion dollar national debt. So we're already in the hole. That, that, I do talk to the kids when I substitute. That's one of the things I try to help them understand is taxation. Like, you know, we don't, who knows that? You don't really understand that as a kid. You don't really get it to you. You're especially if you're a small business person, you start to get it. But as soon as you start to get a paycheck, you start to see it. And it's like, bro, it is horrendous. It is. I want to throw my desk every time I have to do my taxes. I'm serious. It's, it's uh, revolting. And I, I explain this to kids. I explain what they end, end up taking. And I, I say, do you know what the founding fathers threw the tea in the ocean or, you know, in the water with, you know, why they did that? It was like less than 10%. It was like, I think it was like 7% or something. It's eight or eight or 7% of taxation. And it, it was doubled, right? From probably some close to that when they, when King George doubled it. A fraction of what we get tax today. Um, the tax rate, mind you. Uh, we really, really seriously need to do something about that. And, oh, well, what are we going to do with all these things? That should be the local. Local is where it's at. The local is where this is supposed to be handled. And the federal government playing, uh, uh, enabling local business, uh, locals to not take care of their own people. That's why we're in the straits we're in. And then initiate a mass firing. Not a chisel, but a chainsaw style firing. A fuera. Of 70, yep, yeah, 75% of federal bureaucrats start that on day one. That is, of every four people there, three of them will be gone. Definitely by the end of the ter first term and preferably sooner. And problem is when you got a bunch of those people showing up to work who should have never had that job in the first place, they start finding new things to do. A lot of them is writing regulations that Congress never authorized, which is acting like the wet blanket on the economy. And my first action as it relates to the regulatory state is any law that Congress didn't actually pass or specifically instruct an agency to write a regulation for, it's my view and the current Supreme Court's view that it's unconstitutional. Hmm. Rescind all of them yep. and state on day one we're stopping enforcement of those regulations and view them as null and void. Ooh, that grows awesome. this economy. It increases the supply of housing. Think about housing. We have land use restrictions. We have EPA restrictions that are limiting new housing construction. Increase the supply. Brings down the cost grows the economy. Energy, unlock the supply of oil, natural gas, coal, nuclear energy. Increase the supply, bring down the cost. Grows the economy. Stop paying people more money to stay at home instead of to go to work. Increase the supply of labor. Most small businesses, the hardest thing they find right now to expand is to hire new people to fill those roles. Yeah. So even before We're I get to reform of the Federal Reserve, which is a favorite topic of mine, that's not a day one item. Just literally day one. These are the kind of steps we can put into motion. And yes, I think we get back to 4% GDP growth, possibly 5% GDP growth. It could be even magnitude. By the end of my first term. We might land magnitudes of growth because what we're going to do is transform into uh -huh. a hydrogen-based fuel economy. Here we they, go. They figured out at, <laughs> at Rice University how to... He's not they, wrong. Yeah, they take... What's called, <laughs> that is interesting. He needed to hear that. They but, this, but, but he's not... You know, but I think that... Uh, they figured out how to make it profitable to make hydrogen, essentially. This has been the, the entire time. It's like it costs too much money to make the fuel. They figured out you take plastic, you take any carbon trash, obsessed with you hit it with a laser fuel called flash joule heat at 7,000 degrees for 0.1 milliseconds. And it turns it into, you can get hydrogen and graphene as a byproduct, graphene which you can use is as a building material too. to build houses, build roads, to, to enforce your roads by th making them three times stronger. It's 200 times stronger than steel by weight, this material, pure carbon. Huh. And for every kilogram of hydrogen you produce with this process, you get about $4.50 of graphene. And now, then we can sell the graphene. You can also take the oil that this would displace. See Technically, a hydrogen like, economy oh, might displace the oil. He's you can going. turn the oil into graphene so we can keep pumping it and we can keep selling it. Now, as esoteric as that may be for many people, 
the, the core fans of the show have heard it a million times. Yeah, right. <laughs> I think the, the actual show. simple message, though, is innovation in the energy sector. Yes. Beyond just oil. It could be hydrogen. It could be fusion. I mean, there's big breakthrough Both. there. It, Nuclear energy. You can pump the hydrogen through the natural gas lines of the, of the planet. So we've already got an infrastructure. The guy's name is James Tour at okay. Rice University. I'll put you in touch with if you cool. want to go. I you would love to learn like more. He just he came to something. life. He was like, no, oh. I was just going to talk about oh. nuclear energy in terms of Graphy. one of the main obstacles to this. And this, I think, to the extent that this involves actually... What, what exactly laser accomplishes, but it is sort of splitting of the nucleus. It's electricity. Oh, what do you... It, 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 I think that it would it would, it would or not fall within the NRC's and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. No, it's not nuclear, yeah. this okay. process. It's physical breakdown. Just physical breakdown. Got it. So, so I'll have to learn more about that. But I'm talking about at least the production of more kinds of energy in the United States, including nuclear energy. Again, one of the obstacles is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Mm -hmm. And again, the right answer is you can't reform these agencies. I think mm -hmm. the right answer is to get in there and just shut them down chop, one chop. by one. Just say afuera. Afuera. <laughs> no, afuera. Well, I would say afuera if I, means outside. You're trying to say fuego? Yeah. Is that what he was saying on the... Th I mean, when, when outside, you could, like, throw it out. <laughs> when, right? No, when uh, Millet was uh, all pulling saying the is, yeah. things off the wall yelling afuera. You know, I, I, means I, outside. Listen, I've said this many yeah. times. If I have That's not made Javier Millet look like a moderate, <laughs> by the end of my first three months, I haven't done my job. All right? So I like the guy. I've actually been following for a long time. He goes around with a chainsaw. You know? I yeah, think chainsaw the, first, chisel second. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that got me excited about you just as a candidate. It was just, it, it's remarkable to me that we have all of these people that are running, and they make it seem like being America first is something that's dirty, like it's something that's wrong. And I just could not get over all of them parroting this point that we could do both. Right, that drove me crazy. I wanted to scream as we I was walk sitting and there. Chew gum. Yeah, we can do both. We can take care of the Ukrainians and every other country. We can do a look around you. Let's yeah. talk about look around you. Does it look like we are successfully doing both? Mm -hmm. Have we been successfully doing both? I mean, this country has been in a steep decline, and a large part of it is because what ends up happening is what we saw on that stage and what we've seen uh, just throughout this entire election process is just people are bought and paid for, mm -hmm. right? And and the people that they tend to sell out are always the American people. We're told that we have to feel bad, we have to put ourselves last, it's always an American last perspective. Yep. Um, and so it's just been exciting to have you get up there on the stage and everywhere that you've been going and you've been doing so many podcasts. Without question, I think everyone can agree that you have been the hardest working candidate this election cycle. I've seen you everywhere. I mean, I appreciate obscure it. podcasts, it's, it's, it's really wonderful. Just the work ethic is so impressive. Um, and yeah. you're young. Hardworking man in Iowa and told him that that's the reason three, he's voting for so him. It was something that was very important to me. Totally and I'm, I'm just kind of showering you with the compliments here, obviously. I appreciate um, that, But Thank you for that is something that's very scary for me because when we talk about even the process of illegal immigration, you think about that as a parent, this is also going to become issues down the line when we talk about the violence that is going to be imparted in inner cities. This is something that terrifies me. Something that terrifies me. You have unchecked people coming into this country. We know that they are coming from countries where the cartels are running things. We have no idea who is being brought into this country at this moment. As a parent, that's terrifying. Yes. Um, and I just think a lot of the candidates are not willing to talk about these issues in a way um, that is, is, provides clarity to those of us that are worried about the future for our children. I think, most, I think most of the candidates are really reading scripts provided to them by their super PACs or the people who fund them. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I traditional, effectively what American politics political has become marketing techniques. For the worse. And I think you've got to be willing to say, I mean, it's sad the system works this way, but we've put, our family's put over $25 million, close to $30 million into this campaign. There's going to be more going in. It's what it takes to run presidential elections. Even still, it's hard to compete against the super PAC industrial complex where the amount of money being spent on television advertisements by the like of Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis, but it's not really them. It's the super PACs. That's the real cancer on American politics. And the super PACs culture selects for candidates that just make them vessels for advancing what that yep. super PAC industrial complex wants to advance. And so one of the things I think, again, this is an opportunity to go beyond traditional partisan boundaries, building towards a Reagan 1980-style landslide. You got Ukraine in that category. You got the southern border in that category. I think we should be favoring ending, ending super PACs, not by violating any First Amendment rights, but by just saying that, you know what? If there's a $3,300 maximum that you can give to a campaign, that's what it is in the GOP primary. That's a lot of money, but it's not enough to corrupt a politician who's running for president. That if there's a super PAC that's donating to presidential candidates, if you're donating to that super PAC, you should also be capped out at $3,300 per person. I don't think that that's too much to ask. Yeah, makes sense. This used to be a left-wing idea, actually. I think that right now we're at a place where the Republican Party absolutely can and should embrace it. I think it'll be wildly popular, and again, part of building towards 
an 80 plus percent electoral majority minus some shenanigans is still a decisive landslide victory. But anyway, I think that's what's going on is you kind of have candidates when you start to think that they're actually advancing their own convictions, we're kind of missing the point. They're vessels for advancing what the donors really want to wield them to actually stand for. There's this issue in Iowa right now, actually, which is super interesting. I was actually at an event at the state capitol earlier today. It sounds like an esoteric issue, maybe, but it's not really because it affects every American. Is They're building a carbon dioxide capture pipeline across this state that we're in right now. Hmm. So they make a lot of ethanol in the state. They say capture carbon dioxide, build a pipeline across the state, and then bury it in the ground in North Dakota. Why? No one really knows why other than the fact that our federal government's providing subsidies in the name of fighting climate change because carbon dioxide is a bad actor. It doesn't make any sense. I, carbon dioxide is plant food. So this idea of removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere being some sort of worthy goal, I could go on for a full day about why that's based on a false premise. But we're using our own taxpayer money to pay people in the state. There's a business, a couple of businesses that are now using eminent domain to seize the land of farmers here, rights to use their land. Can't stand in eminent when domain. Most Iowa farmers who I've met do not like that being built across their backyard. So I could, I could go a little bit longer on this, but the point I'm bringing it up is not a single other Republican candidate, not a single one, has expressed opposition to this carbon capture pipeline. Why? Because the most powerful people, at least in this state, as it relates to the Republican donor establishment, do not permit you to oppose the carbon capture pipeline. Interesting. Yeah. And so, again, it comes back to that mega money in, in politics. You can, could, could we go a little bit deeper here? Because uh, you, you mentioned the, the, the Federal Reserve just a little bit. And uh, this is an institution created in 1913 that's a quasi-private cartel parading around like it's some kind of private bank when it's uh, essentially not. Thomas Jefferson said that he believes banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies with their corporate bailouts, with the inflation, which is essentially mm. a tax on the poor, a theft of resources from the poorest people in this country and the Fed, yes or no? I would like to, but that requires legislation. Yeah. I make promises that I will keep as your next president. And here's the promise I'll keep with respect to the Fed is a 90% headcount reduction at the U.S. Fed combined with sure. restoring effectively <laughs> a single mandate, one purpose, peg the dollar to commodities, stabilize the dollar as a unit of measurement. It should be just a basic function of arithmetic and nothing more. Yep. And again, part of the problem is you got those 23,000 people or so at the U.S. Federal Reserve now that we don't need to do that narrow function of pegging the dollar to commodities. They find things to do. That's where the central bank digital currency comes from. That's where a lot of these, uh, the CBDC, which is a backdoor way of ensuring a government surveillance system of being able to wipe you out for doing something the government didn't approve of. Right. That's how you get to raining money from on high like mana from heaven in the aim of balancing inflation and unemployment. It's like the equivalent of hitting yeah, two targets Dakota, with one arrow ever heard and missing it both. So hopefully anybody, that answers. Well, so, so there's we'll, no we'll dive a little bit into that because one of the big stories today is that, that I'm aware of done what he's doing Bitcoin when they're ETFs, running. Right? I believe more than just that. Like, it's crypto when they're, market when they're elected, and whatever they'll come on a show like this. About a lot when they're running, sitting down and being able to ask questions like this on the shows of the U.S. government as it pertains to crypto and the fear that they're going to push central bank digital. And by the way, let me use this as a moment to 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 point out point this out this is earth shattering in american politics for someone to skip a debate go right onto a youtube channel have a full length what are we at we're at uh what's my what's my record thing here we're at an hour an hour do you get that where you have q and a no interruptions no tv breaks uh i mean maybe they'll do a break eventually but like no no serious like avoiding the main issue of giving up a person 30 seconds. Um, you just don't, even in a town hall setting, it's, it's rolling. They're not, they're not letting it just flow in the, in the nature of conversation. They're not letting you uh, actually answer the question, especially CNN um, today. And it, this is earth shatteringly different. And, and, when you when you put politicians in those scenarios, they don't do well because they they have to stay on their talking points. They don't want them to, to reveal what they actually think and believe uh, and, and claim that they misspoke. Uh, but Vivek is not like that. Vivek can actually stand toe to toe with a camera in his face and people and just talk and and engage. And that's one of the things that Amanda and I, the moment we we watched the debate. 
between him and on the first debate stage uh, of Republican Party. We were DeSantis fans because I like what DeSantis is doing in Florida. And we went from DeSantis fans by the end of the debate based on how he answered the questions and the the not only not just the smooth talkerness no 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 just the clarity and authenticity he uh, with which he answered the questions and he knocked the questions out of the park it made it so obvious that everybody else on there was a was a stooge uh p- puppet just kind of doing their uh i am supposed to say these lines and and nothing like what vivek does and so that's what is it's night and day difference between what he the kind of candidate he is and the kind of candidate and and the way he's running his campaign night and day social media as well and in new media it is unbelievable and he is incredibly sharp and so i just want to make that statement guys this is this is not your average bear here this is the future of the republican party and vivek is one of those people um who represent, he's like a couple years older than me. I mean, he, he really understands our generation uh, and the conservative values that made America great. And so this is why this is why I support him, Vivek 2024, um, as well as 2028 if he ends up running. So I'm going to go back to the program already in process. Censorship. If you tweeted something that was against the popular narrative, you'd get, you'd get suspended. Many of us were called conspiracy theorists for arguing what was actually happening. In fact, it was reported by, I believe it was Gizmodo first in May of 2016 that Facebook had staff removing conservative news outlets from their trending tab. That's just your ability to speak. I know, one of the more serious things to be able to to, to lose, to not be able to engage in the public sphere. Imagine the same scale of censorship, but in terms of you buying milk, bread, and eggs. Yes. One day you wake up and you go to the grocery store and you're using your app because that's what the central bank digital currency will be forced to be on your phone. And you'll walk up, you'll put your milk on the self-checkout because there's no humans anymore. You'll scan your phone and it'll say, you have been banned from purchasing for 24 hours due to hate speech. Or docked a certain number of dollars. But by the yes. way, just going back to just bring up COVID and the things that we saw throughout That's real. COVID, it's that happening in China. That is what they're that looking about. to do. Uh, just, so you know. just the digitization of everything that was happening at that time. Suddenly, like, they were trying to say your menus could have potentially have COVID. They kept saying that dollar bills. This was. Do you remember this in the news? Oh, yeah. Dollar bills could spread COVID. And suddenly they didn't want any more dollar bills. We're no longer accepting cash. Was uh, cash so many restaurants. Uh, grocery stores, no longer cash because you could potentially spread COVID, which was an absurdity in my mind, an absolute absurdity. But a lot of these things are now long lasting, right? In, in terms of the fact that there's not that many human beings. I don't know if it's the same where you live, but not that many human beings at the grocery store anymore. They kept up the things after COVID oh, that yeah. they said were just for COVID. And I felt that it was very much because they did want us to move in this direction as a society. Well, you can see it in Las Vegas. Potentially to prep us for this. And I just want to play that one step forward to tie earlier to one of uh, an increasingly what looks like a Republican policy, of certainly of a certain candidate, of tying your government-issued ID to your Internet account Mm -hmm. or your social media account. So now combine that with the central bank digital currency. Now you don't have to tie it just milk in the grocery store. Every time you hit like on a tweet, that does not match the regime's approved narrative. They're we already can dock you 50 doing cents. this in China. If you hit retweet, you actually dock you a dollar. Not, and if so you listen Jack to the Smith, Democrats, I just want to tie this together, the right? Technocrats. Right now in the, this is the direction. subpoena for is, one of the federal cases against Donald it. Trump. There's so many of them you lose track. The only way this the stops Smith federal prosecutions. is if we move in, in the that direction subpoena, I think of it's what people re- understanding. It certainly affects reducing people who are watching the power this right now. Might affect some of us in this room. Maybe some of us at this table. I don't know. The only way this happens. Not because I wasn't using Twitter back then. Is one of the only candidates who is going to willing to do, actually do it or with liked the one of Trump Donald has Trump's got, posts uh, in that year. Grind. But Vivek that's now can the subject swing of Jack Smith's better than anybody subpoena. else. So let's play that forward because that, that's his exact, your, your username or whatever has already been the subject of that subpoena. He is a trained lawyer. Now say that that handle so was tied to your government issued ID, which is also tied to your digital dollar. He can't convict you in court necessarily, but why don't we give him a nice little spanking, take a few dollars out of their bank account? That's literally where this vision of the, the so-called Great Reset, that's where this lands. That would be a coup. That would be something that would be an attempted coup by global enforcement powers uh, that we cannot allow to happen. They can already freeze your bank accounts when you're under investigation, say you worked for a company and then all of a sudden one day you can't buy things. But with the central bank digital currency, it goes so far beyond that. We're going Social into the credit system. 
but it's automated. Yeah. It's to where it won't even be a judge saying, I think there's probable cause to freeze his right. account. It's going to be a machine saying, your account is frozen. And good luck. Imagine mm -hmm. having to go to the DMV every time you needed to get your bank unbanned. Mm -hmm. And this is the... Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me if this is like too abstract and we can sort of bring it back. Sounds but like it's a Facebook pattern already. that repeats itself <laughs> in so many different so places where... Pervasive. Right now, you're right. They can freeze your bank account even as it exists today. But it takes something that requires the government to take a quantum step, right? You have to have a preponderance of evidence that's 50.1 to con percent chance of actually having done it. And then to actually convict somebody, you have to be beyond a reasonable doubt. That's 99.999%, 100% certainty. So you have to take these quantum steps of certainty. What the central bank digital currency does is it takes this system that ties a quantum level of certainty and just makes it continuously varying. Right. So it's not like Jack Smith is going to say that he's going to wipe out your entire bank account and freeze your entire bank account. The way this would work is I'm just going to dock you by 50 cents. Like, I think that's actually the thing to see is it wouldn't be if we're using the analogy, Tim, I think it would be less that we're not going to allow you to buy the milk at all. It's going to be that instead of having one hundred dollars, you now have ninety nine. So it's designed to change behaviors at the margin. And that's really There's where this is different from the current status quo, where they Technically, could also freeze your bank account entirely. Couldn't buy any milk. It's not that. It's that you like to post. We didn't quite like. We see that because of your government issued yep. ID tied to your social media profile. It's not like we need to go to the court system for that. It's not like you've done something criminal. But we're just going to dock you a little bit with a little so-called nudge in the right direction. That's actually what's actually but, far more frightening. But uh, with the uh, CBDC, there's so much more here too. We, we we can't even begin to imagine. How about geo locking transactions? Meaning, let's say there is a, uh, a political rally happening in D.C., and the president says mm -hmm. we're going to have a rally. So then anybody who attends that Dude. rally, their, 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 tra their ability to transact is shut off within 50 miles <sighs> and just these individuals. All of a sudden, you can't buy train tickets. You can't buy milk. Okay. You can't buy pizza. You can't go to the they already you can't did go to that McDonald's to, to buy food. And for anybody who thinks that's a ridiculous Canada? example, I, I believe it's Bank of America that handed over records for anybody who was in Washington, D.C. on January 6, 2021 to Jack Smith. Which is exactly not that far from what you're describing today. Not automatically. So, in Canada, but I think it's but worth like, him, I think they, for they the people. Found out who these there's people a lot of people in New Hampshire that fit this category counts. when I'm campaigning there, who this come is, up and this ask. Is exactly like, this will be the first question they ask at a town hall. Is like, tell me about your position on CBDC. I, I share why I think it's a risk, but I think it's important not to fall in the trap of thinking just because we've stopped that, you still have a government that can do a lot of these things to you. It's just that it becomes a lot easier for the government to do these things to you when they can do it in small increments rather than Bank of America having to hand it over to a prosecutor who needed to go through probable cause, a lot of this can just be done much more easily. So even as we put the kibosh on the CBDC, and I will, and that's easy, it's just simple executive action. This is never going to happen in the United States. I'll get that done in January of 2025. A year from now, we're good. It's still just, you know, it's like a water balloon. It's like a hydraulic pump system. You squeeze it here, it's, it's going to show up somewhere else. And so we're always kind of one step behind. And the reason people don't pay attention, ESG, CBDC, whatever, is the more you acronymize it, the more boring you make it, the less likely you are to, the people are to pay attention to it. And I think that's have, why they tech We have time for one more segment before we go to questions. So I want to bring up uh, this issue. This is from ah, Reuters.com. Ohio House of Representatives overrides veto, veto of bill banning gender affirming care. So one of, the, one of the big cultural issues, of course, is the issue around transgender youth, uh, uh, transgender ideology, gender ideology as it pertains to sports. And of course, one of the truths that you have listed is that there are so two the genders. House so many of us were shocked veto. to see that in Ohio, despite the fact that the House oh, wow. passed this bill saying no to child sex changes, yep. the governor tried to veto that. I'm oh, curious your position okay. on this, if you'd like to uh, elaborate and break it down. Yeah, I, I, it happens to be my home state actually. Born, raised, and live in Ohio now as well. So I was disappointed but not shocked is how I would characterize it based on the governor that we now have in Ohio. I actually spoke to the lieutenant governor. I was sort of a what the heck call who I actually have a good relationship with and turned out that he is also against the position that the governor took. And so the governor of Ohio is, is you know, he's like the equivalent of, you know, he's like a, the Chris Sununu's, the Nikki Haley's, the, you know, Chris Christie's, you could say, of the world. DeWine, the governor of Ohio, just falls into that category. I mean, there's a, there's a brand of people who put a nice little R after their name, but aren't really thinking according to clear principles. They're easily captured. I think in this case, what my understanding was, and I haven't talked to the governor, but I've talked to a lot of people who are familiar with the situation, is that a lot of people are making good money off of some of this gender conversion stuff mm -hmm. and sold a myth that 
somehow this is going to cause suicides amongst kids and you're going to have blood on your hands. And so what ended up happening was they just got him to veto it. And well, I'll, 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 uh, that was I, the answer. I, I do want to get into your position, but I, I want to address what you just said about the, the, the myth of the suicide. And I'll use, I'll use the numbers that are widely accepted. There's something referred to as desistance. So you're familiar with this concept? Not really. Desistance is not detransition. Detransition is if someone identifies as trans, undergoes what they like to call gender affirming care, and then backtracks. Detransitioning. Desistance okay. is when a child says that they're trans and, uh, and experiences symptoms of gender dysphoria, but without any transition, eventually grows out of it. Typically, this happens around puberty. Uh -huh. The accepted rates are between 65 and 95 percent hmm. of young of young children who experience gender dysphoria will grow out of it, and they call this desistance. That means if we give the most uh, benefit of the doubt we could to the gender ideology argument, 65 around 65 percent of, of children will desist. Okay. Their argument, however, wow. is good. it's life saving to j transition these children, but suicide Shh. rates could be as high as 48 percent. This means that you are increasing the likelihood of suicide yep. by, by transitioning a child. If, the, if there is a two to one chance the child will desist, do not transition them and then give them a 50% chance of suicide. Well, yes, it is a fact that suicide rates go up after they transition. I cover this extensively on my podcast. I've had transitioners on my podcast, people that have gone through the procedure, uh, you know, got the bottom surgery, as they call it, and then woke up one day and realized their entire lives were a lie. And to hear those stories, I mean, it, it's incredible. It's, it, yes. it's a true evil, and it is being backed by Big Pharma. Uh, there is a lot of money, obviously, with these procedures, the drugs, the puberty blockers that they're putting them on, Lupron, um, and it's a part of a larger problem, something that I'm obviously it's very passionate about in terms of people not being educated and being sold lies and then going through a very radical route uh, via Big Pharma to, to earn money. I don't, I don't so, know how far you want to go with this because um, I, I see a link to transhumanism. I see a link to mm -hmm. eugenics. I see the rise of autism also linked to a lot of this as well. There's a lot of different components that we should really talk about. I, and I think more importantly, especially when it comes to the kind of chemical biological war against human beings, when you look at uh, male hormones and, and women's hormones, they're being dysregulated. They are being directly attacked. Fertility is being directly attacked by a lot of forces outside of us. How can we address a, a larger, what I see clearly, a depopulation agenda that has clearly been put Absolutely. in play and being used against us right, right now? To wrap it all together, I suppose, as president, what could you do to address these issues around gender ideology yep. and even a decline in fertility? Oh, so those are, I, I think there's, there's, there's a couple, a couple right. different issues. I mean, gender ideology, a lot of this is being foisted through the Department of Education, mm -hmm. right? So the Department Shock of Education job. actually get rid of it. uses the federal money as a noose to get local schools to adopt ideologies that the Department of Education decides are the acceptable ones. Keep in mind, the origin of the Department of Education, people sometimes forget, was to prevent southern schools in southern states from siphoning money away from predominantly black school districts to white ones, but it's come somehow... That institution has taken on its purpose to foist these radical gender and, in some cases, racial ideologies also onto local schools. So as it relates to the schools and the ideology piece of it, a lot of this is the head of the snake, the Department of Education. A lot of it violates existing civil rights laws and otherwise. So enforcing the laws on the books combined with actually shutting down the Department of Education is a pretty good start. Now, as it relates to Absolutely. I, what I see as an appropriate place for a federal you could talk about what, how Reagan did it using – you could talk about technically using – how do we get set the drinking age at 21? It was a 1984 law that effectively says you don't get highway funds unless you adopt this particular set of laws that set the drinking age at 21. But forgetting about the legal mechanics and just as a matter of policy what we want in this country, if you're not 18 years old, you should not be getting any chemical castration – or genital mutilation, just as you can't get a tattoo, just as you can't have addic an addictive drink of alcohol. And so my view is we do live in a free country. For sure, at least at 18. If you're an I adult, mean, a fully grown adult, entirely, you're free to that's... dress how you want. You're free how to identify how you want, as long as you're not harming anybody else. Don't expect to change the Dakota, way we Dakota, you and I were just sports. talking about this. Don't expect to change the way we label our bathrooms, to change our language. But if you want to live your life the way you want, as long as you're not hurting somebody else with a presumptive expectation that the rest of society bends to your delusion, you're free to do so. Kids aren't the same as adults. And so I think protecting children is a policy position we've already well accepted in this country. And so the same logic and the same mechanism we use to prevent you from drinking by the age of 21, that we prevent you from getting a tattoo by the age of 18, you should not be undergoing genital mutilation or chemical castration 
as a minor in this country. And I think there's a pretty broad consensus around that. And I, I want to add to this. I think it's interesting because when it comes to the issue of drinking, you can have a drink at the age of 21 and be fine. You can have a drink at the age of 31 and be fine. It's yep. Alcoholism, it's bad. But if at the age of 21, you decide to undergo permanent and irreversible surgery, and that was a mistake, you can't come back from that. That's right. So this is a, this is, there is a serious challenge in how we, how we deal with an issue like this because I don't want people to take their lives. I think that's horrifying. But we did have a guest on this show who said that mm. she thought she was a man. She believed the gender ideology she was being uh, fed on the Internet. And she talked to, I think she said she talked to her brother. And he said, get your hormones checked first. You likely have a hormone imbalance. So instead of adopting the gender ideology and taking testosterone, when she went to the doctor and got her hormones checked, it turned out, uh, turns out that she did have a hormone imbalance. So they prescribed her female hormones. She said almost instantly gender dysphoria disappeared and she was in alignment with her, her own wow. body. Yeah. And so my concern is if someone like that were to undergo a surgery and then regret it later, I'm not going to pretend to know what the, a doctor Can I just say one word about this? I don't know this person or this individual, but there is a really small number of... So I say there are two genders, and, and it's a clear, clear point. There is a small number of people in the general population who have chromosomal abnormalities. So we have, you know, what, 23 pairs of chromosomes. Two of them are sex chromosomes. X, one is X and Y if you're a man, X and X if you're a woman. But there are some people who are born with X, Y, Y or XXY, and that's like a real thing. That's grounded in truth. It's not made up. It's in, it's in your genetics. One is called Kleinfelter syndrome. One is called Jacob syndrome. These are exceedingly rare. We're talking about one in thousands at a much lower rate. So in those particular cases, yes, those are instances of what you will call intersex, which is a different phenomenon than trans. But what's happened is, let's take those rare cases to one side, and I don't know if this person you had here had such a thing or not. I would have said, not, not just go check your hormones. Go actually get a genetic test and actually understand, are you one of the rare people with one of these chromosomal abnormalities? It's inborn. But for the purpose of this discussion in, in our modern politics, I don't think that this pertains to public policy. Take that off the table. That exists, and we're going to acknowledge that. That's like a tiny, tiny, tiny percent of the population that's always existed. It's a chromosomal abnormality. For the rest of people, transgenderism, the belief that you are... Your gender does not match your biological sex. That if you're XX, but you believe you're a man, it is a mental health disorder. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be treated yep. as a mental, mental health, health disorder through mental health care, which often isn't covered by private health insurance. A lot of this is through pharmaceutical intervention. They prefer pill pushing really as an alternative. It's really a problem. Or people who run surgery centers prefer your surgery. Your biology Peddling surgery may, as an based on imbalances, this is a mental be health condition. setting yourself up And once we see it that way, we realize the compassionate thing to do in these from a matters. standpoint, because I think we've gotten put into this box of but being it's somehow not pure, it's not antipathic purely because of adopting this health set of views that or it seems like most of us share. It's kind of a combination of both. I don't think the compassion Dakota, thing I have to do no for idea. that kid is to affirm like actually, that kid's confusion. That's the not ratio, compassion. That is um, cool. I, I would imagine and I think we should actually feel that. It shouldn't be just a thing we the, say. We should acknowledge that and act with the compassion. I would imagine because of how many people actually, unfortunately, are into this situation with a lot of people being outside of the the idea of... um traditional medicine where you're, you're, you're trying to force them in, in an early age and it's not a actual medical need, it, then that has lowered the bar for even people who are very, very, um, unfortunately, uh, mentally ill and spiritually depraved individuals who wanted to castrate themselves and do whatever else to their bodies. I think the bar is low enough. And I think there might be a lot of people pouring through that, that, you know, hole that we've ripped in, in our law, uh, laws and in our medical pr pr uh, professions. But I, I'm not really sure exactly of the ratio. That's a good question. Is it mental health disorder? To say that you consider it so offensive to have a mental health disorder, that that should trigger the fact that you have a mental health condition. To say that that's in such a category that it is so offensive that you said such a thing about me, I think the compassionate thing to do is actually recognize that there are many Americans who go through a lot, especially now more than even 30, 40 years ago, social media and otherwise playing the loss of purpose, the loss of faith. We can go deeper on that. Yes, there are all kinds of mental health conditions that are rampant in the United States of America today. We should have empathy towards people who suffer from those mental health conditions. Figure out how we're going to address that. Bring back psychiatric institutions. Bring back mental health institutions. Address the violent wave of violent crime across this country. But we're not able to talk about that because now what you've actually done is 
abandon your left wing crony, quasi-compassionate instinct or supposedly compassionate instincts to actually just say, we're demonizing you because you have a mental health condition, as opposed to saying, that's the truth of what's happening here. That's what I, that's what I find also, odd about that left wing reaction. The explosion of transgenderism, though, what we've seen over you know, the last 10 years, I would say, is definitely, these people are not being born with a mental disorder. What's happening is they are being given a mental disorder. It's almost like it. Munch, yeah. yeah, this is like a Munchausen by proxy, societal totally. Munchausen by proxy, where you have teachers that are conditioning them, you have parents on the internet that want to be seen as accepting, and they're training their children. They're confusing their children. It's actually systematic abuse that's And happening. the way you know that's true, Candace, is mm -hmm. actually you look at, in COVID-19, they would talk about this, this coefficient R squared, or whatever fancy way of saying how, how fast a virus spreads from person to person. The R squared rate for transgender. A, a, exactly. Any given school where a kid starts to identify as a gender different than their biological sex is arguably far greater than it was for COVID-19. Zero percent in my high school. And now it's, and then, it's, it was like it's one not linear. Four. It's like a it's, it's like it's an exponential crazy. curve. So uh, usually around this time, we would go to our super chats. I will go through these. We'll, we'll grab a few good questions. But uh, as we're setting up the event, of course, the, uh, the events team over at TimCast was like, we're going to ask people to submit questions and then we'll get them to ask the questions. And I said, I don't think Vivek wants to do that. I think we should just grab random people and let them ask their questions. Yeah, yeah. And yeah so I don't I, like pre-screening. Yeah, I said, I, I, I think we should just have real questions, whatever they may be, and I'm pretty sure we can handle it. So we're going to go. I'm not ready for Sweet. Xi Jinping if I can't handle some audience questions. Hey, but look, it's, it's fascinating. Every, every other political campaign is give us the questions beforehand because we don't want to look bad on TV. See? So we're just going to go That's for it. I'm telling you. I, I think uh, Phil, Phil Labonte, of all that remains, is here. He's going to be helping. Uh, Hello. Hey. There we go. How are you doing, everybody? You're very loud. Uh, it's very Phil's loud. discretion, I guess, right? So what we're going to do is uh, <laughs> young Andrew here is going to grab you if you put your hands up. There you go. We're going to have one person waiting here. One person is going to come up here and ask the question. When this person gets done, you can go ahead and move on, and we'll move on like that. Everyone okay with that? I'm okay with it. Everyone okay with that? Yes. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, Andrew, go ahead. You can tell he's an entertainer. What's your name? <laughs> Drew. Uh, this question's for Vivek, uh, but Candace, feel free to add in since you've done a lot of journalism on the topic. I speak not only for myself, but for countless others uh, without a voice and parents that had to bury their children too early. How will you achieve ta cha tangible accountability for those permanently damaged by the COVID-19 vaccines? Mm. When will it happen, and why is it important to you? Army Sergeant retired Drew. Thank you. Drew, thank you for your service to this country. Wow. Thank you, Drew. I, I'll say a couple of things, and you're right. Candace has been ahead of the curve on this issue for the last several years. But I'll tell you what we can do. You can't change the past, but you can at least make sure that where there has been injury, there must be justice. Mm -hmm. And I think, I've, as far as I know, I'm the only presidential candidate to pledge to do this. I will require Congress for this one. I'll try to be clear but it will require Congress. I will repeal the special liability exemptions that pharmaceutical companies enjoy in this country. It is dead wrong mm. and it is unjust. Normally any product that's sold to you, if it harms you, you can sue the manufacturer, except for vaccine manufacturers. Why? Jeez. Crony capitalism, pharmaceutical industry lobbying. Wow. It's disgusting. And actually I love Reagan as a president for a lot of things that he did. He was wrong on this one and actually Closing the psychiatric hospitals was the same thing. Reagan was actually pretty good at getting lobbied by the pharmaceutical industry. People will get mad for me saying that. It's just a fact. It's a fact. It doesn't take away from his other accomplishments. So that's number one. Yeah, not number two, perfect. really, specifically, this one doesn't require Congress. I'm going to do it in my capacity as commander-in-chief for our U.S. military, especially for you as somebody who served. That's why I'm adding this extra element to this. Anybody who lost their job in the U.S. military for making what for many of those young men is obviously the right choice young men and women alike, is that you will have your position restored with full back pay times one and a half. That's something I'm committed to do as the next president of the United States as well. And make sure something like this never happens again. So those that are two be... examples of tangible things I'll be able to deliver you. And I'd like to give the obligatory for our friends over at YouTube. Make sure you talk to a trusted medical health professional oh, yeah, and yeah. podcast about YouTube how here. to take care of your health needs. Great. But, but thank you so much for your question. <laughs> uh, but that's really important, too, because if you think about uh, giving back pay like that, it's like, well, how are we going to afford that? Less wars, people. <laughs> less wars, less injured vets. Less wars, more money to help the ones who are who got injured or have had a complication to something that they while they were serving. Less wars, 
better service for everyone. And so that's that's part of this. DA inserts that warn you of what can happen if you take these vaccines. Um, it's important for people to understand the history of the illnesses that you think you're fearful of, that you have no idea. Uh, mumps, measles, rubella, people don't know anything about these diseases and yet think that big pharma came and cleaned these things up. It's a deep dive that I've done. It's the most important work that I do. Um, and to know that these injuries, people getting sick, the seizures, the autoimmune diseases that we're seeing today, um, it is all related to the vaccines that they're giving children. And it is directly related to the lobbying. We've got more big pharma lobbyists than we do have Congress members in D.C. And that is entirely problematic. But um, it's going if to you get are taken a parent off YouTube. You I'm glad I'm streaming to Facebook. Could get is not Facebook. educated about vaccines. I, I created an entire series on it called A Shot in the Dark. And as I said, we only use above the board because i am not a doctor you should not listen to me <laughs> i am just a mother of three children i don't vax any of my children as people know um but it's get educated you know be, but I, be informed before you before you jump into getting vaccines you should understand what the risks are yeah bill and gates I, I wanna, definitely knows what's right right and i want to stress this point too because a lot of people have also responded to us when we've said you know find a medical professional you trust hey if you go to a doctor and they're a bad doctor and they're not giving you good advice you got a bad doctor same is true for any plumber or carpenter there, there, there are good doctors out there that can that can tell you what you need to know, and I recommend you find them. It's very empowering to question your doctor. Well, the first time you do it, you realize they're just people, yeah. and they'll answer your question. Second uh, opinion like are a normal thing. I don't trust fat doctors, but that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, shall we? Hey, can I can I actually ask? I got two people here. I was going to bring up earlier. I forgot is if if oh, you guys absolutely. are caught, if we can pull up a chair. Yeah, absolutely. You got, yeah, actually, yeah, absolutely. got uh, Jeff Shipley and Steve Holt, two state legislators here in Iowa, who actually endorsed me in the last 24 hours. And actually, one of them, I want to bring up, these are good, a lot of these are state-level questions, too, smart guys, strong constitutionalists, and got, uh, Steve Holt in particular was a, I hope Steve doesn't mind me saying this, was a strong Ron DeSantis disor d d d uh, disorder <laughs> endorser and, and came over <laughs> Oops. Uh, today as well. Fre so Freudian I'm glad slip. you guys came, came over, over to the light. So join us up here. Eddie, you're here too. I didn't All know right. you were here. Wow. Three strong constitutionalists. Bring, it, bring them up here. We can just spread them out, spread them out around here, have some... Lawmakers, we especially got we got Iowans asking the questions. Yeah. These are the people they've they've Maybe. elected. And do we have any other questions? Glad to have their know. support. Phil. Yeah. Yep. Good to see you guys. Yeah, you can lend them your mic if they wanted to say anything. Yeah, or, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Same same as mine, and then we could we'll grab more questions as well. Welcome to the freaking show. <laughs> should should these gentlemen introduce themselves? <laughs> yeah, perhaps? absolutely. Do you guys want to? Let's. Uh... Yeah, Eddie's right by you. You want to start with Eddie? Oh, here we go. Eddie. Hey, Eddie. Eddie was the first one to endorse me. I appreciate that. Here you go, lean in. Hey, hey, what's up, Iowa? That's all I got to say. <laughs> I think technically I have known Vivek longer than anybody here. Uh, I followed this guy. I saw him on CNBC, and something told me, you know how we used to say back when we were kids, something told me to follow this dude. I liked what you said. It wasn't about politics. And ever since then, I've been following you uh, long since you... you woke Inc. Book Tour, I think was Yes, that. and yep. uh, you signed that woke... Inc. book to my favorite Iowa legislator. Thank That's you very what, much. That's all I got to say. <laughs> he was the first one I met, but it was also my favorite, yeah. and I've loved you ever since. And He's a good when, man. When Vivek announced, I want to say March, fe February, February. Yeah. Um, he had a 0.1% name recognition. Not approval. Like, nobody knew who this guy was, and I said, you know what? If you drop this guy in Iowa... His message is going to resonate. And you have to hear him like four or five times because everyone else is well known. But I just knew that this guy is doing four or five times the work. So <laughs> thank you, man. Keep I it up. Appreciate the, appreciate the support. Good guys. Oh, yeah. Eddie Andrews. I represent Johnston, Urbandale, Sailorville, and a little bit of Southwest Sankany right here locally in Polk County. Good man. Good man. Steve Holton, you always want to say a quick hello before sure. we take more questions, probably. Sure. Good. Yeah. So, good evening, everyone. I'm Steve Holt. I spent 20 years in the United States Marine Corps. I've been in the Iowa House of Representatives. I'll start my 10th year. If you Google me, you'll find out I'm the guy that ran the bill that banned gender transition surgeries and Amen. hormone therapies in Iowa. Uh, I'm also the guy that ran constitutional carry in Iowa. You'll find I kind of do those things. Um, That's right. I had... I had earlier uh, endorsed Governor DeSantis early on. I didn't know a lot about Vivek. And my decision, my decision today to, <laughs> to uh, endorse uh, Vivek wasn't anything about Governor DeSantis, but rather his message has resonated with mm -hmm. me. We are having an identity crisis in this country because 
of the relentless attacks on our national identity by the left and by the mainstream media. This is a 1776 moment, and as a United States Marine who fought for this country for 20 years, I'm not going to miss that moment, and I'm proud to be God supporting God bless. Amen. Here we go. We got a strong, liberty-minded patriot here, too. Uh, Greetings. Well, hello. Uh, I first just want to thank God and thank you guys. It's an honor to be with so many amazing Americans here on this panel and in this room. It uh, really is a great privilege. My name is Jeff Shipley. I serve Iowa House District 87. I'm in my, my sixth year as a legislature, and it's just very exciting to be a part of the caucus process awesome. and uh, influence the national debate here. Thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Candace, if I don't get a picture with you, my wife's going to kill me. I will let you get a picture with me. Two pictures. Thank you. Thank you. Shall we grab some more questions? Yeah, let's do it. I'm actually I go by Eve Apologist on the Discord. Hi everyone, glad to be out here. Oh, I gotta announce that Discord. Again. Thank you. We're on you. number three now, but hello. Uh, I know you see a lot of people, so I'm probably just yeah. But I'm here. It's good to see you. Thanks. Okay, so tough question for you today. We're going to talk religion, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, Vivek, here it considering comes. your experience attending Christian schooling while not identifying as Christian, could you elaborate? on how that experience aligned with your family's religious beliefs and if you faced any judgments or challenges from the institution or your peers. Uh, my concern is that as I prepare to get married and hopefully become a mother, that our family may experience difficulties and even imposter syndrome as we venture into exploring private and homeschooling options. And the same is true of the overarching focus on what are called Judeo-Christian values time and time again and have me as a tra traditionalist wondering when the other shoe will drop for me and my loved ones who are not religious yet share the same values from a secular viewpoint. <laughs> I know that your first truth is God that God is real. And although I respectfully disagree with that solitary point, I would earnestly nope. like to know if you think it's Against possible the founding fathers, for families without with a focus that, in secular humanism wouldn't have a constitution. to have a similarly positive experience in religious Rights education. Come from God. Founding or a place in your movement where one of the tenets of unifying principles stands in direct odds with our religious freedoms. So... It's a great question. I, I uh, first of all, think that the job of the U.S. president is to swear an oath to the Constitution and to keep it. That includes the First Amendment, which includes religious liberty, the freedom of religious exercise, which includes the right not to practice a particular faith either. And so that's squarely the job of the U.S. president. And I think that, I mean, those are, those are, there was a a lot of thoughtfulness in that question because, yes, I was the lone Hindu student in a Catholic high school in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I did take a, w a lot away from that religious education despite not converting to Catholicism at the end of it. And so my core belief well, system is that there's one true God. Catholicism is not God puts us here for a purpose. Christ without it's the It's our church. moral it's duty to realize that purpose, that we're all equal. God works through us in different ways, but we're all equal because God still resides in each of us. That's the heart of my faith. When my you Hindu get faith. saved. I think there's deep compatibility with the values. It's a different faith and a different theology. But the value system, including the Judeo-Christian values that this country was founded on. You know, what do the Ten Commandments say? I read them for the first time in ninth grade. There's one true God. Don't take his name in vain. Observe the Sabbath. Honor your parents. Don't kill. Don't lie. Don't cheat. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. Don't covet. Broadly, in, in simpler terms, that's what broad, broadly they say. If I, as a Hindu, can certainly find common purpose with those shared values, and I do, and I think those are Judeo-Christian values. I think this nation was, as a historical fact, founded on Judeo-Christian values. Hey, there you then go. Then I believe somebody who has a Kantian worldview, or, or pick your favorite secular ordering can also find common cause with those values. I believe it's easier to arrive at those values just mentally if you anchor yourself grounded in God. I think it's actually a lot harder to get there through it secular is. worldviews. If you want to follow, you know, Immanuel Kant or whoever else, I think it's a harder path. But to answer your question, more can somebody who is secular, non-religious, agnostic, or atheist still find common cause with the shared value set that this country was founded on? Absolutely. And even more, even if you disagree with some of those values, do you have the right to live in this country? And are you still protected by the same constitutional rights? The answer to that is also absolutely yes in the United States of America. And that's what it means not to run for pastor. And I would be certainly an odd choice to run for <laughs> pastor of a Christian church. 
But that's not the job of the U.S. president. The job of the U.S. president is to swear an oath to the Constitution and to keep it. I mean, as far as I know, one of our conversations, I mean, Steve is... Um, going to enact just and he's a, and he, you, legislation and, and act it. Right. And, and I think that we're not here not to create it. out of our role to join the ministry together, but out of our shared commitment to the Constitution. And so the answer to your question is yes. And I am sharing with you always what my true convictions are. We are one nation under God. It's part of our creed. I think part of what's happened in this country is we've turned God into a four-letter word, which I don't think should actually, is good good for our culture. I don't think it's good for kids. I don't think it's good for national unity. But that doesn't mean that if you're an atheist, somehow you're not welcome in this country. I think that as long as you share the shared commitments to the Constitution, you're still an American, and that's what matters. So thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Except you don't support the things that actually support liberty. How you doing? What's your name? Summer. Can't help you there. Summer? Summer. Yeah. Till you repent. I might yak. That's okay. Yeah, summer. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> On January 4th, a deranged individual named Dylan Butler went to the Perry High School. He killed 11-year-old Amir. He wounded seven others, including four students, three staffers, before killing himself. I'm genuinely terrified Can we mandate the presence of armed staff members in public and private schools? Schools contain America's most valuable resources and should not be soft targets. There are many teachers, janitors, counselors, and school administrators that would be more than willing to receive training and obtain a conceal and carry permit to protect our children. I want at least one armed staff member in the building before the school doors open in the morning. I mean, it's really, it's really, um, I mean, it's really a tragedy what happened here in Perry, Iowa. And I think the worst tragedy of all was the fact that the reaction to it was, I mean, just certainly from a national perspective, was almost numb, actually. It wasn't a national story. It was a story here in Iowa. I happened to be in Perry the morning when it happened. We saw a bunch of ambulances, helicopters. You knew something was going on. The question was, we're going to cancel our event. We canceled the political event, but we kept the yeah, event intact too. is a prayer session and, <laughs> right. and an open discussion All of for Wisconsin, people in the community. And for it was sure. amazing the number of people who came who otherwise wouldn't have just because they wanted to speak openly. The short answer to your question is I don't think one is sufficient. Just That's just a logistical point. I think we need a minimum of three armed security guards in every school across this country. Some schools that are really large might be benefit from four or yep, five. Minimum of three. States that lack the funding to do it have a great place to start. Shut down the Department of Education. Return the money back to states, and for yes. a tiny fraction of that, you and could have three or four in every school across this country. Steve, you were going to mention something? Or Jeff, yeah. I just want to tell you that there's a school district in Iowa that was going to, uh, they went through extensive training. They were going to arm personnel, not teachers, but they were going to arm personnel. They went through extensive training with law enforcement. They, they were actually putting more round, rounds down range than police officers were. The training was extensive. They had lock boxes. They covered every base. It was amazing. And then they weren't able to do it because the insurance company, we have unfortunately about one insurance company in the state that that, uh, insures schools. And they said, we won't insure you if you you have armed personnel in the school. And so the legislature and I were, were working to try to address that and fix it. We're looking at school resource officers, a lot of other issues, but absolutely trained individuals that are trained properly in a school that is your absolute best line of defense and we're working if you just caught that insurance companies are the reason why your children are getting killed aside from sin protected how you doing what's your name jeremy so hold we had a follow-up to the question So, so this is certainly i think the most important issue we're facing with and what we're seeing among kids i just represents the corruption of our nation and just the decay of where society's gone because you can predict the future of a country just by looking at the kids. Um, this has been a hard issue for oh, me because over tell me two that. years ago, we had an incident in a school district where that. a teacher was stalked it's and murdered by students and, and the weapon was a baseball your bat. average kid in Kenosha. Um, I think what I want to say is that this is a, a much larger pattern and the catastrophe in Perry, w- there's been a long, uh, p- a very growing pattern of a very violent behavior. So there's a student Veterans in Ames in these jobs would be amazing to code, a part of absolutely. some strange race baiting exercise where, uh, you know, they wanted the, the autistic kid to say uh, the N-word, and then they wanted to beat him unconscious. And he had to leave the school in an ambulance. And 
I can only imagine the trauma of a student having to witness that and now the trauma of that student still being in the same building with those kids who perpetrated that horrific act of violence. Uh, and it, it, it's much more severe than just this incident and armed security is a great way to prevent the symptom from manifesting, but there's something much, much deeper going on in the hearts and minds of our children where they're willing to you know, commit these psychopathic acts. So it's, it's a very serious issue and it's much more widespread than just these events. This is certainly a growing pattern. The pattern appears to be growing worse and I'm truly frightened. And I was having a conversation yesterday with our colleague Representative Bowden about these issues and I just wanted to get on my knees and pray because we need as much help as possible in navigating these issues and giving our children uh, a life worth living and, and the meaning and the values. Uh, so it's, it's horrific and yet yeah, armed security is certainly a great step in the right direction but we need to go as deep as possible to help these kids through whatever they're suffering through. Jim, my name is Jeremy. My name is Jeremy. Hey. Um, so Vivek, I was like, I feel like this kind of goes along with the last question. I feel like morale has been on a steep decline in this country for quite a long time. Um, I feel like mental health kind of plays into that and yeah. kind of going with the last question. Um, I believe a big reason for that is the American dream is just getting farther and farther out of reach for a lot of us. Um, so my question to you is, will you get foreign interests and corporate interests out of real estate? And if, in, or if so, how would you make that hmm. happen? Sure. Well, I think with respect to China, I think it's a simple answer. China's buying up land in this country. They shouldn't. Any CCP affiliate should not be buying land in the United States of America. Yep. And that's, that's oh, yeah. an easy answer. But I think there's something deeper going on in this country. And there is a sickness. And I think that what happened in Perry, Iowa, that's a symptom of a deeper void in this country, a void of purpose and meaning and identity. And I'll be the first to say, I don't think a U.S. president can alone fill that full void, but I think we can fill it partially with a national identity that we lack right now. We're hungry to be part of something bigger than ourselves, yet we can't even answer what it means to be an American today. And I think that's half the job of the next U.S. president, actually. We actually have had some great policy discussions mm. today. But I think half the job of the next U.S. president, not a congressman or a senator, but the U.S. president, is to revive our national character, to answer who we actually are as Americans, to fill that void of purpose and meaning with something other than wokeism or transgenderism. Well, I would say to or climatism it because or COVIDism. The real place Otherwise, that the same defines reason you America see is local. Anxiety, fentanyl, not necessarily suicide, gender so dysphoria. It'd be a good kickstart, but these are symptoms of that deeper local void of is how we do purpose it. and meaning. And I do think part of the job of the US president is to get out of the way so that pastors and parents and teachers and coaches across this country can play their role too. But I'm stepping up and volunteering to play my part to revive that missing national identity in this country. And yes, you're right. People tend to be more proud of a country when they're making more money in that country. I'm not this guy. They really wanted me to be the fake optimist. The American dream is alive and well. I think that was actually literally a line of one of the other presidential candidates. But it's not. It's alive and hanging on for life support is where we are. But I think it can be well again. And I think that that's going to take simple economic policies that at least grease the wheels for still filling that deeper hunger. We're using our taxpayer money to pay people more to stay at home instead of to go to work. Now, I talked earlier when Tim asked the question about stimulating the economy. That's bad for the economy because that stops businesses from growing and filling open positions, which is this top obstacle to business growing. But take the person who's receiving the money. Do you think it's actually good for them? I mean, my generation, how old are you, man, if you don't mind me asking? For, we're in a similar generation with a lot of us here, you know, give or take, is we're the first generation, ours, that the parents of our generation are actually responsible still for the financial sustenance of people our age and younger. Yep. For the majority of us. That's the first time that's happened. You think it's good for you to be in your parents' basement playing video games, smoking pot? Is that good? Is that actually good for you? People don't Again, it's know. It's not compassion. It's almost a form of other cruelty driving don't know. depression it's and not anxiety just our and worse. Gen. And so it's that's the where economy. the economic malaise and the psychological malaise of this country go together. And I do think it's going to take a president with fresh legs 
coming in from the outside, seeing it as part of our responsibility to address that national identity crisis to get this right. And I hope I'm up for the job. I think I am. That's why we're doing this. Thank you, man. Usually around this time is when we wrap, but I think if everyone's cool with it, we'll uh, maybe another another half an hour to give you more time to answer Man, the questions. I'd love to see unemployment that you get a little and then it, it scales down and you, after six months it disappears unless you get a job and then you actually get paid a little bit more than when you weren't working because we need to incentivize people to take the job. Well, uh, we'll try and get as many questions as we can in and we'll do something that the cable TV channels can't do and I love go that. long because we can't. See, another thing. I love that. Get some more questions? <laughs> A lot of questions. Why is graphene the best? <laughs> question for Ian. Why are you so cool? <laughs> it's mostly your endorsement, Ian. It's this cool uh, shirt that Tim bought me. Oh, thanks, Phil. What's your name? <laughs> Brad. Thank you. I'm nervous, too. All right. Don't worry. You should good? be. Nice to meet you. You're nervous. fine. <laughs> um, so, you good? We're good. Uh, I feel like you've been grilled for a few hours, so I was going to do a question, but I just want to give the first part, which is a compliment. Um, I'm continually impressed with your poise and strength as the media seems to attack you. Uh, I'm a combat veteran of the Marine Corps, and now I do neurosurgery for a living. Wow. I know I don't look like it. I have a sleep tattoo, but no, <laughs> I'll never get a job, right? Uh, in both my careers, people like you have made great leaders. So thank you. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for your service to this country as well, my man. I appreciate it. What's your name? Julie. Um, I just wanted to ask you your um, opinion on all this green energy stuff and the climate change stuff, because um, honestly, I don't think the government should be telling me, you know, what kind of stove I should have. And mm. for some of us <laughs> who live on a lower income, you know, the burdens that that kind of stuff would would cause would be, you know, astronomical. Yes. Well, I'm going to say something that you're not supposed to say, even in the Republican Party, but it's the truth. The climate change agenda is a hoax. Yep. And here's the dirty little secret. It has nothing to do with the climate. What it has to do is I can almost at least prove it to you very quickly. The very people who are most opposed to the use of fossil fuels in the United States are also the ones who are perfectly fine shifting those same carbon emissions to places like China in the name of stopping global warming. You can't believe both those things at the same time. Or the very people who are most opposed to fossil fuels are among those who are the most opposed as well to nuclear energy in the United States, which is the greatest form of carbon-free energy production known to mankind. Yep. Again, you can't believe both those things at the same time if you're applying principles of logic. But if you're subscribing to a quasi-religious cult, I won't even call it a religion because the religion has withstood the test of time. I would call this a cult, climate cult. You can believe anything you want. And they even have their patron saint, a uh, modern what they view Joan of Arc figure, uh, psychologically yep. challenged individual known as Greta Thunberg, who they you know, view as a modern Joan of Arc patron saint time figure. It has yeah, all the qualities of religion. Flogging yourself, gas stoves, self-punishment, engaging in the equivalent of wearing a hair shirt, and flogging yourself. Many religions across cultures, Hinduism has a version of this too, is engaging in sort of bodily discomfort and harm to substitute for this self-punishment. That's kind of what the climate religion is. It has all of the elements of a religion except not having withstood the test of time, which is why I call it a cult. Now, what am I going to do about it? Any mandate from the federal government to even measure carbon emissions is out the door. I think we're even measuring yes. the wrong thing. We should be measuring human health, economic mobility, prosperity, rather than this one arbitrary measure of carbon emissions. And the problem is when you start measuring it, you actually have something that all four of us here are opposed to, is all kinds of strange things the federal government starts doing, like subsidizing people to capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, build pipelines, bear it in the ground. You have all sorts of strange things like subsidizing electric vehicles. I have no problem with somebody choosing to buy an electric vehicle because it looks cool or drives the way you want it to or whatever reason you want to, really. Just don't expect me to pay for it, which is exactly what's happening today. And by the way, if they can build a pipeline across your backyard without your consent to bury carbon dioxide in the ground, next up is your gas stove. They'll come in, take it, leave a $50 check in your mailbox. That's eminent domain for you. Or take your cow or take your combustion engine vehicle. And so this is a cult. I think it's one of the greatest threats that we face in the United States of America to our sovereignty today is the global climate cult. And it is shameful that I think it is outside of the Overton window of even the Republican Party to actually talk about it in the terms that I just did. But we have to see that. If you think COVID, it, it, it's, it sort of has a similar pattern to it. But at least that came and went. This one's here to stay. I think that was just the practice round for the climate emergency that's coming up. And actually, I'm 
I've supposedly been the most censored presidential candidate according to this nonprofit group. But one time where my social media account was outright locked, it's only happened once, was when I stated certain hard facts about the climate movement. Eight times as many people died last year of cold temperatures rather than warm ones. The earth is more covered by green surface area coverage today because carbon dioxide is actually plant food. And the reality is 98% reduction in the climate disaster death rate over the last century. The number of people who die of climate-related disasters, for every 100 who died in 1920, that number is two today. That's due to advances powered by fossil fuels. And so Just that's the inconvenient the fake truth. Fact for the checkers are going to be movement. all over these. And it's going to take a leader with the spine at the hour. top in the United States not to do the waffly thing. The, the Republican thing to do Got here to is do damage control. Why are we moving so quickly? China's not doing stuff either. I mean, these are sort of Nikki Haley type talking points, or, or even other Republicans. It doesn't matter. That's a standard Republican line on these on these matters. I think the right answer is actually to start with the truth. This is not an existential risk to humanity. Climate change has existed as long as the Earth has existed. And we should not be focused on one metric of carbon dioxide emissions when people are dying more of bad climate change policies than they are of climate change itself. And so Absolutely. One thing to add to that, pollution is a serious problem in the modern age, especially with the amount of produ production we do between clothing and plastics and things like that. So pollution is a real problem. It is significantly problem. Actually very a huge problem in india in particular funny enough um and on top of that uh, that is something that we can do a major part of and our generation understands this that there's there's just wisely using things and trying to make sure you're re having things that you don't have to constantly read you know one single use stuff very important um uh, but that's that said it's not it's not a you don't have to be obsessed about it i'm using a single use you know cup from from summer moon here uh you know, so the, it's not a whole, if you can, right? If you can be wise, be wise. So that's just, just a thought there. Be exciting to be a part of all of this and have candidates come. We don't see anyone in Nebraska unless, you know, they're worried about that one uh, electoral vote that we might give to the <laughs> Democrat. So <laughs> we don't, we don't have a primary till May. So if you are from Iowa, please, please, please caucus on the 15th. Thank you. And I, I appreciate that. I'm going to use that as an opportunity, Tim. I'd be remiss if I didn't say it tonight, but, but I mean it. Is Every person's vote in the Iowa caucus, you could make the argument that it's like the equivalent of a million people in the impact that it has in actually selecting the next U.S. president. I laid it out earlier, and so I don't want to rehash our earlier discussion. I believe we're being led by the system into a trap right now. And I promise you, I don't relish this job, but I'm here for a reason. We've done over 390 events in Iowa. That's more than all of the other candidates combined, I think, by a multiple. We're not doing this for any reason other than the fact that I think our country requires, like right now, a leader who's actually able to take our America First movement to the next level and who is not the subject of elimination in the, in the subject of an actively playing out plot that we can see in straight eyes. And so I'm asking everybody in Iowa who is here to do the right thing for our country on January 15th, and I'm asking you to caucus for me. And if you do, I think we're going to have a major surprise on Monday. And I think we're going to do everything in our family's part, and we're going to succeed at it to make sure that our country's best days are actually, not in some fake yeah, politician Iowa's way, one of the but in a true first way, states actually still it's a swing state. ahead of us. So thank you, everybody, who comes out on Monday night to do that as well. I appreciate it. Particularly if you win Iowa as a Republican, What's your name? it's Elliot. pretty good. Hey. Uh, Candace, gentlemen, I appreciate y'all uh, making their it out here. Uh, primary. Braving the inclement weather. Um, so I got in the Marine Corps Iowa. about a year ago, largely due to how the current administration handled, as Ian so correctly frames it, our uh, surrender in Afghanistan, as well as the way service members were treated in regards to the COVID vaccine mandate. And though I appreciate your answer to the first question, Mr. Rabaswamy, as uh, commander in chief, do you have any plans as it relates to restoring Americans trust in our military institutions? And do you intend on holding military leadership who implemented these disastrous policies accountable? Yes. And I think the way we're going to restore trust isn't by fake jingoism. It's by actually acknowledging the failures and instituting accountability for those failures. It comes on a couple of levels. First is 
generations of foreign wars that have not advanced our interests. Seven trillion of our national debt owed to the wars in both Iraq and Afghanistan that palpably could just look at the results. 20 years later, for God's sake, the Taliban is still in charge. 20 years later, Iraq is a more broken country than we showed up, right. sending tens of thousands, about 15,000 of America's sons and daughters' lives, sacrificed in those two wars, adding $7 trillion to our national debt. So yes, I do, I do hold accountable the bipartisan foreign policy establishment, some of whom are back at it again, available on the Republican ticket, ticket to be voted for for U.S. president, to be trotted back and to bring back a Dick Cheney vision for our foreign policy that should be relegated to the dustbins of history. So yes, we need accountability. I think we also need accountability in the nearer term for the self-hatred that our own military is perpetuating in our own ranks. And, and the, there's a connection between these two. I'm referring to the rise of sort of the woke infection in our U.S. military ranks. These are not two separate issues. What happened is that General Mark Milley's of the world wanted to deflect the left-wing criticism. Keep in mind, it was a generally a Republican idea to favor the Iraq War. The left used to hit him for that to say, okay, well— We'll just say the magic word, systemic racism, white rage, whatever you want us to say, but go away. We'll blow the woke smoke to deflect accountability for the institutional failure of the military itself. The woke smoke. How do we do get like this it. right? Restore the true purpose of the U.S. military. What is it? To win wars, to actually avoid wars through being strong in protecting our own homeland right here at home, which is more vulnerable than it has ever been. So I believe that the top purpose of the U.S. military should be to protect Americans against threats, make our national defense spending directed towards our own national defense. That includes cyber attacks, super EMP attacks that could take out our electric grid in a matter of days that we're more vulnerable to now than ever. We, I do view it as an invasion on our own southern border, and I believe an outward-facing function for our U.S. military at our border, as we talked about earlier, is an appropriate use of our military. And that's how we restore trust. I think people would be happy to serve this country if they knew it was actually to serve Americans rather than to fight somebody else's war halfway around the world so some Ukrainian kleptocrat can buy a bigger house. <laughs> that's not going to happen on my watch. And I think that's how we restore trust. Thank you. Is Apoorva here? And my wife? She's, she, she, if Apoorva's here, bring her up at some point. She's going to come. She's putting the kids to bed, but she wanted to make it for the end of this. So, Shout out to Apoorva. The generator. What's your name? Yeah. Alex. All right, uh, nice to see everybody here. Big fan of the show, big fan of you, Vivek. Thank you. Um, so in uh, primary schools in Russia, they currently teach their students uh, jab and a cross before they ever teach a hook for two years. Uh, in China, they have masculinity training for their young men. Um, if you look at the obesity rates in America, we have been, we've done a severe disservice to our youth in physical education, uh, where traditionally you look at like the De La Salle program out in California back in the 1930s. We were going to go a certain direction and then we flipped to another where kids can just you know opt out of PE. Uh, what can you do to help make uh, America's youth strong as president of the United States? Yeah, you know, I think that Let's put aside the presidential authority here. I think that a lot of this should be driven by the states. I'm a constitutionalist. I believe that which is not reserved to the federal government is reserved respectively to the states and to the people. Yeah, and I believe that because they're not my, not my words. They're the words in our Constitution, in our Tenth Amendment. But let's just talk about the broad policy. I've actually just as a citizen advocated often for the SAT, standardized testing. I think you have verbal and math. They added a writing section. I think it's not bad to bring back a physical fitness section as well. Just measure it. Different institutions can put different weight on what they want to weight it in. Not all students, not all schools should weigh the math scores the same way as the way the reading score, as the same way they weigh the writing scores, the same way they weigh the physical fitness score. But I think we should make it something worth aspiring to in this country. So that avoids any kind of mandating or anything like that as a basic first step, just signifying we're measuring something because it's worth measuring. Carbon emissions, not worth measuring. Physical fitness in young people, worth measuring, right? And so, so the things that you actually measure are the things that actually presumably matter. We used to have the presidential fitness test. It was actually under, I think it was President Obama, and it might have been a little bit of a pet project of Michelle Obama, for whatever reason, to eliminate the presidential fitness test. That's not what it sounds like in the context of me saying it, of the U.S. president, though we could determine the, I think it doesn't hurt for a president to disclose how many push-ups and pull-ups they could do too. It doesn't hurt. But that's not what I'm talking about. It refers to the presidential fitness test in junior high school that refers to a number of attributes of how you're able to perform on basic parameters of physical fitness 
that allows us to hold our system accountable and teachers accountable and schools accountable for how well we're doing on, on that metric just as well as how well or these days how poorly we're doing on the metrics of math or reading proficiency. So I think that measuring it alone and making that a norm in this country would be a free, non-cost enhancing, non-liberty infringing way of actually doing what I think is good and important for our country. And oddly enough, I don't think it's that odd actually, that's going to have a palpable impact for the better on the mental health Good question. I don't know how many pushes you can do. Actually, a lot of young kids are going to be mentally and psychologically a lot better off if we actually start just measuring and aspiring towards improved levels of physical fitness as well. I think most of, this, most of us know that intuitively. It's definitely true from a data perspective as well. So that'd be my answer to your question, and I do think I've already been talking about it. People have asked me, why is this guy running for president? What does this have to do with it? Well, what it has to do with it is it still relates to that root cause and that loss of purpose in our country. And I do think that measuring physical fitness is strictly a good step for our youth and including integrated into our schools and standardized testing. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. What's your name? Ryan. Ryan? Hey, Ryan. There you go. Um, so I followed your campaign um, since basically the beginning and uh, I love your message. I think you could fix this country. Um, we've seen well, the what they've done issues. going after Donald Trump. Um, indictments, uh, even trying to remove him from the ballot in certain states. My question is, how do I vote for Vivek Ramaswamy without sending the message that I am okay with what, with what they are doing to Donald Trump? Mm. Wow. Great I think question. your question weighs on the lo minds of a lot of people I met today. What I saw in many of the rooms I was in was a sense of struggle with that question of loyalty. And I think our loyalty, my loyalty, and I know Donald Trump's loyalty and the loyalty of the people participating in this caucus process is to this country. So the question is what's right for the country. Let's just agree with that. Whoever you're going to vote for, that's what matters here. Not loyalty to me, not loyalty to Trump. It's loyalty to the United States of America. The founding I think you have, if you want to, I'm going to be blunt about this. I think if you want to save Trump and save this country, a vote for me is actually the way to go. What they're doing to Donald Trump is wrong. I have stood up against it at every step of this process to the point of derision, to the point of people have, there's, I mean, people have had all kinds of conspiracy theories about me, but one of them and more popular ones is there's some kind of Trump plant that Trump and I had some kind of deal early on in this campaign to somehow eliminate Ron DeSantis as though this was a worthy goal for a guy who's got other things to do in life than to focus on eliminating Ron DeSantis from contention. No, that was ridiculous. But I'm saying that I've been so strongly supportive of Donald Trump in the face of these prosecutions that even many people circulated nonsense like this. I've stood up against, I went to the Miami courthouse, I've stood up against these persecutions. For God's sake, I have actually written a FOIA demand and submitted it, Freedom of Information Act request, to know what Biden told Jack Smith, what Merrick Garland told Jack Smith, followed through on that, taken legal steps, and I hope we get accountability. I think that we weren't, I wasn't planning on announcing this tonight, but might as well just say it. I think tomorrow morning, if not by noon, by tomorrow morning in the next 48 hours, I am submitting an amicus brief to the Supreme Court arguing for why they need to overturn Colorado's disastrous decision to try to keep Donald Trump off the ballot because it's the wow. right thing to do for this country. Awesome. And as somebody who's been trained in the law, I feel like a sense of obligation to do that if somebody who understands the Constitution. I've, it's my belief that every other Republican, myself included, needs to withdraw from any ballot that forcibly withdraws Donald Trump from the primary ballot yep. because... That's how you actually stop the brazen election interference in our own primary. If every other Republican nullifies Maine, then it has no impact. So that's the length to which I've gone. And so people know this about me when I'm saying this. At this point, it is my firm conviction that this system, which has ratcheted up the threat level one by one to eliminating Donald Trump from the ballot, will stop at nothing. I, I'm increasingly certain it's We'll stop at nothing to keep this man away from the White House. So I think the best way to literally save Trump is to at least have arguably somebody the system might actually even, some elements of it, prefer less than Donald Trump for what I'm bringing to Washington, D.C. 
And I think that's also what this country they're requires. They're scared of Vivek more than they're they honestly him. scared of Trump. At many steps. They told the him you can't fire those Trump civil service bureaucrats Trump because of syndrome. so-called but civil like, service the protections. People, Read the law. Like behind the scenes, those civil service protections do not apply because Vivek, to mass Vivek firings. Mass firings are what I'm bringing to the D.C. Sharper. bureaucracy. Okay. So I will honor the man, and I have, and I think it's the right thing to do, and I will do it as the next president. Detailed. Because he kept us out of foreign wars that didn't advance our interests, and he grew they're, this they're economy. Those are no two small accomplishments. But our America First agenda does not belong to Donald Trump, just as it doesn't belong to me or anybody else up here. It belongs to you, to us, to we the people of this country. And we owe it to this country to make sure that movement does not end with Donald Trump, which is what the system has set up to do. I believe we're being led into a trap right now, and it pains me to watch it. So I'm asking you to do the right thing for this country. If you want to support Donald Trump even, or what he represents is actually more precise, the right way to do that, to see this through for the country, is a vote for me in this Iowa caucus on Monday. And I think people are, there's an emotional component to this, I actually think we need to vote with our brains. There's times when you vote with your heart. There's times when you vote with your brain. Your heart can get you to the doorstep of why America first matters. But now voting with your brain is asking, are you going to look back? Here's the thought experiment that I'd like for every voter in this state to go through. And I think a lot of them are considering myself for Trump heading into Monday. Do you think you're going to look back a year from now and say whatever God forbid happens this year, Say we were shocked by what happened. I mean, last time it was a man-made pandemic and a tech-rigged process leading up to an election that we all know was absolutely an unfair election. That was last time. What do you think they're going to do this time? Are you going to be shocked next January and say, oh, I was shocked that that happened? Or are you going to say we should have seen that coming? And I think it's exactly going to play out. If it's not me in the nomination slot, it's going to play out exactly the way I laid out. It's going to be Trump in a two-horse race versus a puppet who they can control. One way or another, they're going to eliminate him. We're going to look back and say that should have been obvious when, in fact, right now, people are behaving as though it's not. And we're going to regret the result. And I don't think there's a good chance. I don't think we have a country left, not the same country that we know and love. And so we owe it to this country and to our founding fathers to make sure the 250-year experiment does not end this year and that we have yet another 250 years and then some left to go. That's why I'm asking you to vote for me. If you want to save Trump and save this country, vote for me. And I hope that gets you to the place where you make the right decision for this country. Thank you, man. I think we have enough time for two more. Yeah. That's good. Two more questions. What's your name? Tim. Tim. Good name. <laughs> it's a great name. <laughs> it's okay. Hi, my name's Simon, and uh, I have a question about civic duty voting. Uh, I'm trying to get my friend to get on the uh, Vivek train, but uh, he, he likes a lot of the, uh, most of your things except for civic duty voting, and so I have uh, his concerns. He uh, just doesn't think it has a point to it. Uh, young adults uh, voting, there's no other way to get young Americans to vote besides making it harder. The test will only hurt the Americans who don't have access to good education or resources. So poorer communities is what he said. Also, you're an adult at 18. You can be tried by court. You can go into the workforce and be a part of the community. You should be allowed to vote without taking a test like an American citizen is what his concerns are. Cool. So what I would tell your friend is, first of all, I would say this in a, in a friendly way, relax, in the sense that this, this, anything touching this would require a constitutional amendment. But why don't, you, why don't we talk about forgetting the plumbing of how we accomplish it? Let's at least see if we agree on the spirit of it, which is that in order to be a full citizen of a country, and citizenship is not about what you get. It's actually about what you give. Women didn't have citizenship and didn't have voting rights in this country. People think it means, what do you get? You get the right to vote? No, women were citizens all along, didn't have the right to vote. So if you actually trace our history, what's the origin of citizenship? Citizenship is about allegiance. It's about duty. It's actually why I don't believe that dual citizenship is a coherent concept in the United States. It's all about, or in any country, it's about allegiance. It's about, and with allegiance comes a duty. So with that said, the basic point I was making is, what's your basic duty at least? We should expect of someone to a country. Some people will make cases for mandatory military service. I don't. But I think the basic table stakes of your duty to this country should be to know the bare minimums about this country and the Constitution and our history. It's mainly just the Constitution and the way the government works. 
And we know that we, that's an intuition we already track because if you're an immigrant to this country, we say you can't vote. You can have all kinds of other benefits. <laughs> we give all kinds of benefits to illegal immigrants to this country. There's all kinds of things we do. But at least when things have worked the way they're supposed to, you can't vote in this country until you become a naturalized citizen, which requires you to pass a basic civics test. And so if we require that of a legal immigrant to this country before they cast a ballot at the ballot box, I think it's reasonable for every high school senior who graduates from high school to at least know the bare minimums about the yep. country that By every the way, immigrant has to know, know this, as a condition for becoming a voting agreed. citizen of this country Actually, before the age of 25. Uh, I think it's they a didn't want to give anybody now, who had life experience as an like, adult. I'm willing to drop it. A if you say that you've served in a military or first like responder role, great. That's a different uneducated. way of having they were or nervous. to a country. But like, the they had minimum, serious so, so deliberations. Nobody has to take about a civics that. test. They're like, but the bare minimum guys, like, are to say that you have some, there are some knowledge really stupid of the country there. of like, which you're a citizen. They were going to get the vote. I was here in Iowa, and so this actually generated a lot of controversy. So they had to figure it out. No, they figured it out. They were rolling out this idea because it didn't poll well. Kind of everybody did. I said that. But this was a debate. Can we Should there be any criteria? It did not poll well. Beyond citizenship, merely beyond citizenship in order to vote, right? Th this was an actual deliberation. And obviously, you know, there were other things we had to work out as well. Like, for instance, uh, um, you know, women and then the ability of uh, African-Americans and things like that. So uh, when you start a country, there's a lot of things you got to figure out. When you start a business, you don't you get it all right on policy, how you want to do your rest of the business right from the get-go. The same goes for our nation um, when it comes to that. And that's why there was the amendment process built into the process. And that's the same thing for slavery and, and women's rights and things like that. The appropriate, you know, that kind of thing. Now, when it comes to this issue, this is an important thing. It, it's rational. If a person comes here and wants to be a, a citizen of the United States, part of their ability to be able to vote is to pass a civics test. And it makes total sense um, to be able to have an informed citizenry who are going to then understand what they're doing when they vote, which is unfortunately not the case in current America. Absolutely. We are more educated, quote unquote, uh, than ever before in human history. And we are stupider as a nation than ever before in human history. And so this is, uh, th this is incredible that we are, uh, th that we're at to the place. And, but part of this is going to have to be, there needs to be something that has to be done that allows there to be recognition that there's there's an order that we have to maintain as Americans. So that's part of what that's a, I think it's a great I think it's a great idea. Here, um, by, so your slogan has been truth, and it's all over this room. Um, many Americans over the years have felt lied to by our government, and that they have pulled the wool over our eyes with so many occurrences in history, especially in the last four years. Recently, you have been speaking what recently happened with January 6th, and you're constantly be getting attacked. So thank you for speaking the truth on that. Thank you. Um, there have been many, there have been so many whistleblowers, such as Snowden, to expose the truth to the American people about what is going on behind closed doors. My question to you is, do you have it on your radar to grant pardons to those who told the truth to the American people, and also to release documents that would uncover a lot of unknowns to the American people? Oh, yeah, or to provide protections to future whistleblowers? Yes, yes, and yes is the answers to your questions. I mean, I think that so it returns our part and be a clemency, but I think that if you swear an oath to the Constitution, your job is to keep it. And so you cannot systematically participate in the violation of those constitutional freedoms and constitutional rights without exposing that to the public. And I think we, the people, deserve a government that just tells the people the truth again. Not just when it's easy, but when it's hard. Sometimes it's ugly. That's when we need it the most. And I think we've been systematically lied to. You could just go to the last eight years, seven, eight years. Trump-Russia collusion hoax. Made up. COVID origin. Couldn't say that it came from a lab in China. When it was obvious that it likely came from a lab in China now that we know that it did. How our money's being spent in Ukraine right now. The truth about what happened on January 6th. The truth about the Nashville transgender shooter manifesto. So we're... You know, we actually went down to Nashville, Candace and I did an event there together calling on the local police or the FBI, either one, to just release that manifesto. And how we were actually lied to, even in that community, they said there's a lot in there that it's not what you think it is, but it could be dangerous to release. Then it gets released, 
And we see it was just actually a race baiting, psychologically challenged person. A government that has systematically lied to its people. The reason people don't trust the government is that the government doesn't trust the people. Trust is a two-way relationship, actually. And so I think the two ways we rebuild trust in this country, we had the event last night. Did you? Yeah, we were, you, were, you were all the way, you could, both of you were there for the press, press gaggle afterwards. That was a fun press gaggle we had last night. People should watch that one. It was the longest one I've done in a long time. We do the events and the press will come up afterwards. It's about 35 minutes. I think we want to rebuild trust in this country. If two things happen, I think we have taken a quantum leap forward. We're, on, we're, we're back on track as a country. They're easy to do. The President of the United States tells the American people what we know about the subjects where the government has lied to the people. UAPs, tell us the truth. What happened on January 6th? Just tell us the truth. What was Saudi Arabia's role in 9-11? They, we know they lied to us. Just tell us the truth. Just go straight down the list. What was, what was or wasn't known about the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq? Just tell us the truth. How many times as a government official, we saw the Twitter files, any time a government official has pressured a private actor or a company or a bank or a tech company to do something the government couldn't do directly, just publish it as a first step. Tell us the truth. Was our taxpayer money used to fund the gain-of-function research that resulted in the origin of the COVID-19 pandemic? That's the first thing that it's up to a U.S. president to do from the standpoint of the government. And then if just one person in the media, just one, I, I don't need NBC and ABC and CBS and CNN and everybody else doing it at the same time, just, just one of them, look their audience in the eye and tell them when it came to the Hunter Biden laptop story that was suppressed on the eve of the last election, when it came to the Trump-Russia collusion hoax, when it came to the origin of COVID-19, when it came to the truth of the totality, at least even, of what happened on January 6th or the Gretchen Whitmer kidnapping plot or whatever. We didn't tell you the whole truth. We're sorry about it. Here's why we didn't. These are institutional failures. And here's why we're going to make sure that never happens again. And I know you're still not going to trust us tomorrow. But we hope to re-earn your trust by repeatedly telling you the truth transparently. Part of that. And we regret what happened. And we fired the people who were accountable like for hiding it from you. If you have a president who does that for the White House... And just leadership. one, not not all of them, just one they don't, actor they don't in the mainstream media who does that, looking their audience their in the eye on a TV screen and telling them the same thing. We are well on our way to reuniting and reviving this country. If I'm your president, that's going to happen from the presidency. And I think there's probably at least one good, enterprising, smart person still left there in the mainstream media that could step up and do the same thing. And if those two things happen... I am confident that we don't have to be mired in this divisive decline that we're in, but that we still can be in our ascent. I believe that, and I'm going to do my part, and I hope those in the media who, who have failed have step up and do their part. And, you know, all I'm going to ask is of the citizens of this country to do your part here in Iowa starting on Monday, and that's what gets us there. So thank you. I appreciate I, you asking the I question. Think sometimes I think that it's more valuable to lie to the people and, and it's actually better in that we're talking about like secret weapons programs. You mentioned UAPs. If we're working on like the atom bomb, they didn't want to come out and be like, by the way, Germany and everyone listening, we're building an atom bomb. They didn't, they were like, are you building an atom bomb? No, we are not building an atom. So, so there's times that you want to blatantly lie and not even like. Not like say that the thing is not existent. So, so I, I disagree about the distinction between secrecy versus lying. I, are there certain s state secrets, they need to be state secrets. Yes systematically lying when asked about it, I think is a different matter. And so I think that's a, that's a hard line to draw. But, it, but you and I would still agree that at a certain point, you have a government that still tells the truth to the people again. And I think we deserve to know the yeah. truth of all Timing. the way what happened to, Timing I mean, what's the truth of what happened thing. to JFK? I think we should know. Um, I mean, I think the public should know. We've been non-transparent about it every step you know, of the way. People call years, me conspiracy years, theorists for asking the question. That's, that's not the point. That's the point is, deception. the government just deserves to, at a certain point in time, tell the people the truth again. And I disagree with you even in the near term in the short run it could be an inc it could be a more convenient thing to do to lie to the people but in the long run i think the answer is always to actually stand for the truth and if you get into the specifics even of geopolitics this relates to the historical neocon neoliberal view of strategic ambiguity right so non-transparency at home goes hand in glove with the foreign policy worldview of strategic ambiguity it's a whole worldview that says you're going to actually be in a stronger position if you don't tell people what you're going to do. 
I actually view it the other way. I think that if we have clear red lines and actually say that, you know what, we are nuclear equipped and here's where we are, that's actually going to, if we tell a country that if you cross this red line, we're actually going to have major consequences to pay for it, that's more likely to actually avoid war than it is to actually engage in strategic ambiguity. And so it's just a I totally different worldview when it comes from the to traditional specificity, neoconservative and you know, neoliberal vision that I'm bringing, which is probably, transparency at home, nuance which actually translates to, you like, don't need the national security the charade if your like, whole foreign oh, policy open. strategy was you know, also there's grounded. There's some reason here. In truth. There's some lines, logical You're actually lines. saying that this is what we're okay with, and this is what we are affirmatively not okay with. And here are the conditions under which we will blow you to annihilation, because we have to, and if you cross that red line, we follow through and do it. But the rest of the time, we're not going to pretend like that's a possibility either. And so it's a total alternative worldview all the way up and all the way down. But it is grounded in, yes, absolute truth and transparency. And so that's what I'm going to bring. And if you think that that's dangerous, if you think that that poses risks to the future of our republic, then I'm not your guy. I'm not your candidate. But if you believe with me that in the long run, this is the way to respect the founding ideals of this country and to lead a country that is stronger over the long run for relying on truth, both in our foreign policy and our domestic policy, then I don't think there's anybody in this race who comes close to being able to deliver that in the way that I will. So that's what, that's what I offer. I want to thank uh, Vivek for having us out and for thank everyone you else here who's, having uh, me. who's I joined and has, has hung out with us. We've got uh, a special members only segment, VIP. We're going to be hanging out at this private party keeping the conversation going for a little bit while longer. So head over to TimCast.com, click join us. And in a few minutes, we will have up a live feed hanging out on the couch, talking a little bit more about uh, what's going on behind the scenes. And I want to say thank you to everybody who showed up here physically, everybody who watched the show. You can follow the show at TimCast IRL everywhere. You can follow me personally sure follow. at TimCast. Make sure you smash that like button, subscribe to this channel. But uh, let's, I don't know if you want the last word, so we should go around before coming back to you, Vivek, and we could have Yeah, let's do that. Luke, if you want to shout anything out. Yeah, sure. If you want to support me, you can on thebestpoliticalshirts.com. The phrase that I'm wearing <laughs> right now was actually highlighted by Politico, and they were actually uh, showing a picture of my hat, but they conflated this issue with uh, conspiracy theories. And what happened with Jeffrey Epstein is not a conspiracy theory. It's a conspiracy yeah. fact. Independent media has been talking about it for many years now, while the corporate prostitute horse dream media has literally been covering it up. Shame on them. Criminal <laughs> actions by these SOBs that deserve to, of course, be recalled. Fight back. Spread the word. Wear the shirts. The best political shirts.com is the best way to support me. And uh, e even though, uh, Vivek, uh, you want to peg the Fed and I want to end the Fed, thank you so much for coming here <laughs> and being a part I of this broadcast. I want to end it too. <laughs> and, taking, and taking questions that are not scripted. Uh, we're actually going to continue the conversation on also the best political show.com where we are going to have you as a guest soon as well. So I look forward to that as well. Thank you so much. Nice. Yeah, I'm uh, Ian Crossland, if you don't know what's happening, guys. Follow me, Ian. And uh, take care of yourself, your, your stomach, and your heart, and your brain. Kind of reduce the acidity. Um, <laughs> let, the, let the oils flow through you and get in touch with God that way. It helps pretty good. So now's the time to start eating healthy and do a plank. Do like a 30-second plank or something, too. <laughs> no but, seed oil. Graphene. Ian does more. No, gra no graphene. Yoga, no. It, and then the we'll talk does. about graphene. <laughs> <laughs> Ian, it's been, a, it's been a pleasure to sit next to you tonight. Thank you. This has been I just want to say wrap it up. Guys, you know where to find me. You can subscribe to my YouTube channel. Also, just want to re-mention the series, A Shot in the Dark, for people that are interested in learning more about vaccines and big pharma. I think it's the most important work that I do. And I just want to say it's a tremendous honor to be on the road with Vivek this week. We're going to be Notice she didn't mention that she's tomorrow. with the Daily Wire. So this is just not an officially sanctioned, sanctioned so Daily Wire appearance. I can appearance. throw power to him. I just, I'm, I'm really impressed with their campaign. Appreciate it, Candace. Thank you. Close us out. Yeah, well. Look, I. It's because they're disabled. I'm guided by my gratitude to this country, actually. I am not, I don't covet the office of the president. And if there's somebody else who can step up and do this job better than I can, they will have my support and I, full optimism for the country. But I do think we're in the middle of a kind of war in this country right now. Mm -hmm. And I don't use that word lightly. I don't think it is a war between black and white, as the media would have you believe. I don't even think it's a war between Democrat and Republican, for some of the reasons we've talked about here. I think it's a war between those of us who love the United States of America and our founding ideals. That too. And a fringe minority who hates this country and what we stand for. 
It's a war between the permanent state and the everyday citizen. And I think we need, right now more than ever, a commander-in-chief, a general, who's actually going to lead us to victory in the war. I think you got to know you're in a war to win one. Can't be asleep at the switch. I think you can't be bought and paid for by that existing system. Every politician's dancing to the tune that their biggest donor, my biggest donor is me. If you didn't know I don't that. report to them. I report to you, the people of the country. But I think now more than ever, it's also going to require somebody with fresh legs. And I think somebody from the next generation to reach and lead the next generation of Americans. And Notice so, how many people are age. If you agree with me on audience. that, I'm going to ask you to vote for me. Starting in Iowa on January 15th. It's going to be a cold night. I'm told it's like minus 12 cold. No, no, no. Minus huh. 22. Minus, minus 22, 22 cold. Okay. Well, Oof. Yeah. I think that I think that this could actually be for the people who want to support me to be the next president. You know what? George Washington, I don't think, complained about the weather when he crossed the Delaware either. Mm -hmm. And I think we're in we're in a 1776 moment. I think we are in a war for the future of our country. So despite it being cold, I'm going to ask the people starting right here in Iowa to safely bundle up, be warm, but come out on the night of the Iowa caucus. Do the right thing for this country. And if you circle my name that night, I think we have a good shot at winning the Iowa caucus. And if I win the Iowa caucus, I'm your next president. And if I'm your next president, we get done the things I'm telling you we will get done. And I am confident that our best days are actually still going to be ahead of us. So thank you guys for having me. Thank you everybody this, for hanging out and watching this show. And we'll be back tomorrow. We'll see y'all then. Okay, that was it. This was history. Uh, Dakota, awesome. Yes, he should sell shirts for that. Yes, I think he does, actually. I, I haven't bought any of his merch yet. It's on my list to go do. Um, also, I've been trying to save money. But when I'm able in the spot, I'm buying merch, uh, particularly before the election. And uh, that's one of them is the 1776 moment and things like that. Um, they're... Uh, just to cap this all off, I think what you've saw tonight is this is a this is a whole new experience in American politics um, going direct to the people. There were 80 some thousand people watching just on YouTube um, on other channels that they were broadcasting to in numerous um, far more engaged people too. And the reality is, even if the numbers are all, all of us are, you know, they're always working on improving numbers, the, the place for media is direct to you without the, the um, visor of modern media getting in the way of trying to censor, of trying to, you know, prevent you from actually seeing who what's under the mask because they're giving you these 30 second sound bites on this news program. And th this was authentic. You get, you were almost in the room with them, pretty much, and and this was a, this was a discussion. And there are many other videos you can find on his, um, on his program that where he's just record on his channel. Go to his channel. Go to his Facebook page where he's just recording his discussions, at the table with Iowans. Um, he'll actually just recording it Gary V style. It's amazing. And this is the change. If you haven't been in, into this yet, this is what we are now doing in, in modern day is engaging with people where they're at without the cultural gatekeepers in the way through the modern media, through legacy media. This is the new way. And if you're a someone running for local office, this is the best thing that you can do is, is become... Kenosha News, become the Journal Times, right? Become the Racine County Eye. You become the news source for local experiences. You become that person, and then you have an opportunity to already speak to and, and engage with the people that you're hoping to serve and lead. And you're going to get to know them on a level because of the level kind of engagement that you can have now in modern times. This th this is what you can do. 
I also hope that you've now seen uh, just is Dakota and, and anybody else who has been watching or will watch this feed later. Uh, Vivek is a different kind of candidate. That's why I have he's got my vote. He's he's the kind of candidate that will actually deliver the kind of things that not only our generation cares about, but the ideals that America was designed to be for. And it's not just vain promises. You're, you're, you're hearing him articulate exactly what he can and can't do, which you can't, you don't generally hear from any presidents. You hear promises of literally promising the moon when you they can't do that. And so Vivek has clearly delineated all throughout his campaign what he can do and what he can't do. And he said, I'm going to get in this office and here's what I'm going to do on day one. This is happening. And because he can do it, there's no vain promises. There's no, oh, we don't know if he's actually going to. No, Th these are things that, that are constitutionally proper for the president to do. And he's not going to have any red tape. It's it's not going to be any, any, any hooks. Now, he's mentioned the areas where there will be red tape, which is anything involving Congress. That's the most difficult battle he'll have is congressional approval for anything um, and being able to coordinate, especially with the GOP who is in current control of the Congress uh, from being able to have any kind of backing um, in the Congress. So it's going to be, if he gets elected, it's going to be equally a battle. And so we're going to need to continue to vote out the swampers and the rhinos out of our party um, and vote in people who are going to be like these kinds of people, like Vivek style people who aren't going to take um, just vote the party line and, and just be them puppet for these super PACs and, and for whatever, um, it, it's actually going to be really engaged with the media uh, that he is his people. He's engaging through his own media, the real people and getting to know what their needs are and actually, uh, actually bringing that forward into the, what we are ought, ought to do as an American executive. And so this is one of the reasons he's got my vote. Um, so it was really fun to do this tonight. Uh, I'm going to continue to uh, add additional things to this throughout the week to come. I hope that uh, you'll keep joining me. I um, hope if you end up seeing this at some point and you watch any of this uh, throughout the week, um, that uh, you'll you'll come and join me now and then. I'll be commenting on a lot of different things that are happening in our culture um, between actually cultural matters. Um, I'll be commenting on education matters, political matters, things about theology and things about um, how we actually do work today in the modern world um, throughout the week. Get um, Make sure you uh, subscribe, connect with me um, here or on LinkedIn, and uh, I hope to see you again soon. Thanks for joining me tonight. I'm out. Mm -hmm.